Chapter One of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. In any status-hungry culture, the level a man is assigned depends on what people think he is, not on what he is, and that, of course, means that only the deliberately phony has real status. Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Chapter One. In other eras, he might have been described as swacked, stewed, stoned, smashed, crocked, cockeyed, soused, shellacked, polluted, potted, tanked, lit, stinko, pie-eyed, three sheets to the wind, or simply drunk. In his own time, Major Joseph Mauser, category military, mid-middle caste, was drenched. Or at least rapidly getting there. He wasn't happy about it. It wasn't that kind of a binge. He lowered one eyelid and concentrated on the list of potables offered by the auto bar. He'd decided earlier in the game that it would be physically impossible to get through the whole list, but he was making a strong attempt on a representative of each subdivision. He'd had a cocktail, a highball, a sour, a flip, a punch, and a julep. He wagged forth a finger to dial a fizz, a slow gin fizz. Joe Mauser occupied a small table in a corner of the middle caste category military club in Greater Washington. His current fame, transient though it might be, would have made him welcome as a guest in the upper caste club, located in the swank Baltimore section of town. Old pros in the category military had comparatively little sufferance for caste lines among themselves. Rarified class distinctions meant little when you were in the drill, and you didn't become an old pro without having been in spots where matters were pickled. Joe would have been welcomed on the strength of his performance in the most recent fracas in which he had participated as a mercenary, that between vacuum tube transport and continental hovercraft. But he didn't want it that way. You didn't devote the greater part of your life to pulling your way up, pushing your way up, fighting your way up, the ladder of status, to be satisfied to associate with your social superiors on the basis of being a nine-day wonder, an oddity to be met at cocktail parties and spoken to for a few democratic moments. No, Joe Mauser would stick to his own position in the scheme of things until through his own efforts he won through to that rarefied altitude in society which his ambition demanded. A sour voice said, Celebrating, Captain? Oops, Major, I mean. So you did get something out of the Catskill Reservation fracas. I'm surprised. A scowl, Joe decided, would be the best. Various others in the course of the evening had attempted to join him. Three or four comrades in arms, one journalist from some fracas buff magazine, some woman he'd never met before, and Zen knew how she'd ever gotten herself into the club. A snarl had driven some away, or a growl, or a sneer. This one, he decided, called for an angry scowl, particularly in view of the tone of voice, which only brought home doubly how his planning of a full two years had come a cropper. He looked up, beginning his grimace of discouragement. Go away, he muttered nastily. The other's identity came through slowly. One of the telly news reporters who'd covered the fracas. For the moment, he couldn't recall the name. Joe Mauser held the common prejudices of category military for telly and all its ramifications, not only for the drooling multitudes who sat before their sets and vicariously participated in the sadism of combat while their tranked, bemused brains refused contemplation of the reality of their way of life, but also for category communications, and particularly its subdivision, Tele, Branch Fracas News and all connected with it. His views, perhaps, were akin to those of the matador facing the moment of truth, the crowd screaming in the arena seats for him to go in, and the promoters and managers watching from the bereta, and possibly wondering if he were gored, if next week's gate would improve. The telecameras, which watched you, as, crouched almost double, you scurried into the fire area of the metralius, or perhaps a maxim, 
the telecameras which swung in your direction speedily avidly when the blast of fire threw you back and to the ground the telecameras with their zoom lenses which focused full on your face as life leaked away the spanish affectionados never had it so good the close-up expression of the dying matador had been denied them the other undeterred sank into the chair opposite his face twisted cynically joe placed him now frank soligen give the man his due he and his team were right in there when the going got hot more than once in the past fifteen years joe had seen the little man lugging his cameras into the center of a fracas taking chances expected only of combatants vaguely he wondered why he demanded why ah uh, soldier said major by the looks of you you're gonna have a butte comes morning why don't you stick to trank cause i'm not a slob joe sneered why why what listen you want me to help you on home got no home live in hotels military clubs in barracks got nothing but my rank and caste he sneered again such as they are soligen said mid middle aren't you and a major zen most would say you haven't got much to complain about joe grunted contempt but dropped that angle of it however he could have mentioned that he was well into his thirties that he had copped many a that he had copped many a one in his day and that now time was borrowed when you had been in the drills as often as had joe mauser the days you lived were borrowed borrowed from some lad who hadn't used up all that nature had originally allotted him he was well into his thirties and his life's goal was still tantalizingly far before him and he lived on borrowed time he said why are you exception how come you get right to the middle of it like the time on the panhandle reservation you could a copped one there soligen chuckled abruptly as though in self-deprecation i did cop one there hospitalized three months didn't read any of the publicity i got no i guess you didn't it was mostly in the category communications trade press anyway i got bounced not only a rank on the job but up to low middle in caste there was the faintest edge of the surly in his voice as he added i was born a lower major joe snorted so was i you didn't answer my question soligen why stick your neck out most of you tele reporters stick it out in some concrete pillbox with lots of telescopic equipment he added bitterly and usually away from what's really going on the tele reporter looked at him oddly stick my neck out he said with deliberation possibly for the same reason you do major in fact it's kind of the reason i looked you up trouble is you're probably too drenched right now to listen to my fling joe mauser's voice attempted cold dignity he said in category military soligen you are never so drenched you can't operate the other's cynical grunt conveyed nothing but he reached out and dialed the auto bar he growled okay a sober up for you an ale for me i don't want a sober up i'm being bitter and enjoying it yes you do the little man said i have the answer to your bitterness he handed joe the pill you see what's wrong with you major is that you're trying to do it alone what you need is help joe glowered at him even as he accepted the medication i made my own way soligen i don't even know what you're talking about that's obvious the other said sourly he waited sipping his brew while the sober up worked its miracle he was compassionate enough to shudder having been through in his time the speeding up of a hangover so that the full agony was compressed into mere minutes rather than dispensed over a period of hours joe groaned it better be good whatever you want to say fred soligen asked at long last 
tilting his head to one side and taking Joe in critically. You know one of the big reasons you're only a major? Joe Mauser looked at him. The telly reporter said, You haven't got any mustache. Joe Mauser stared at him. The other laughed cynically. You think I'm drivel happy, eh? Well, maybe a long scar down the cheek would do even better. Or possibly you ought to wear a monocle, even in action. Joe continued to stare as though the little man had gone completely around the bend. Fred Soligen had made his first impression. He finished the ale, put the glass into the chute, and turned back to the professional mercenary. His voice was flat now, all expression gone from his face. All right, he said. Now listen to my fling. You've got a lot to learn. Joe held his peace, if only in pure amazement. He ranked the little man opposite him in both caste and in professional attainments, besides which he was a combat officer and unused to being addressed with less than full respect, even from superiors. For unlucky Joe Mauser might be in his chosen field, but respected he was. Fred Soligen pointed a thin finger at him, almost mockingly. You're on the make, Mauser. In a world where few bother any more, you're on the way up. The trouble is, you took the wrong path many years ago. Joe snorted his contempt at the other's lack of knowledge. I was born into the clothing category Subdivision Shoes, Branch Repair. In the old days, they called us cobblers. You think you could work your way up from mid-lower to upper caste with that beginning, Soligen? We don't even have cobblers any more. Shoes are thrown away as soon as they show wear. Sure, sure, sure. Theoretically, under people's capitalism, you can cross categories into any field you want. But have you ever heard of anybody doing any real jumping of caste levels in any category except military or religion? I didn't take the wrong path. Religion is a little too strong for even my stomach, which left the category military the only path available. Fred had heard him out, his face twisted sourly. He said now, You misunderstand. I realize that the military's the only quick way of getting a bounce in castes. I wish I'd figured that out sooner before I made a trade out of the one I was born into. Communications. It's too late now. I'm in my forties with a busted marriage and the proud papa of a kid. He twisted his face again in another grimace. By the way, the boy's a novitiate in category religion. Some elements were clearing up in Joe's mind. He said in comprehension, So we're both ambitious. That's right, Major. Now let's get back to fundamentals. Your wrong path is the manner in which you're trying to work your way up into the elite. You've got to become a celebrated hero, Major. And it's the telly fan, the fracas buff, who decides who in the category military heroes are. Those are the slobs you have to toady to. In the long run, nobody else counts. I know, I know, all the old pros, even big names like Stonewall Cogswell, and Jack Alshuler think you're a top man. Great. But how many buff clubs do you have to your name? How often do the buff magazines run articles about you? How often do you get interviewed on telly, in between fracases? Have the movies ever done the Joe Mauser story? Joe twisted uncomfortably. All that stuff takes a lot of time. I've been keeping myself busy. Right busy getting shot at. I'm a mercenary. That's my trade. Fred spread his hands. Okay, if that's all you're interested in, shooting lads signed up on the other side or getting shot by them, that's fine. But you know, Major, he cocked his head to one side and peered knowingly at Joe. I've got a sneaky suspicion that you don't particularly like combat. Some do, I know. Some love it. I don't think you do. Joe looked at him. Fred said, You're in it because of the chance of promotion. Nothing else counts. 
Joe remained silent. Fred pushed himself. Who are the names every fracas buff knows? Jerry Sturgeon, captain at age 21, and so damn pretty in those fancy uniforms he wears. How many times have you ever heard of him really being in the drill? He knows better. Captain Sturgeon spends his time prancing around on that famous Palomino of his in front of the telly lenses, not dodging bullets. Or Ted Soul, Colonel Ted Soul. The dashing soul, with his two western style six shooters slung low on his hip, and that romantic limp and craggy face. My, do the female buffs go for Colonel Soul. I wonder how many of them know he wears a special pair of boots to give him that limp. Old Jerry's a long-time drinking pal of mine. He's never copped one in his life. What's more, another year or so, and he'll be a general. And you know what that means? Almost automatic jump to upper caste. Joe's face was working. All this was not really news to him. Like his fellow old pros, Joe Mauser was fully aware of the glory grabbers. There had always been glory grabbers, from the mythological Achilles, who sulked in his tent while his best friend died before the walls of Troy, to Alexander, who conquered the world with an army conceived and precision trained by another man, whose name is all but forgotten, to the swashbuckling Custer, who sacrificed self and squadron rather than wait for assistance. Fred pushed him. How come you're never on the lens when you're in there going good, Major? Ever thought about that? When you're commanding a rear-guard action, maybe, trying to extract your lads when the situation's pickled. Who's in the telly lands where all the stupid buffs can see him? One of the manufactured heroes. Joe scowled. The who? Come off it, Major. You've been around long enough to know heroes are made, not born. We stopped having much regard for real heroes a long time ago. Lindbergh and Byrd were a couple of the last we turned out. After that, we left it to the Norwegians to do such things as crew the Contiki, or to the English to top Everest. Whether or not the Britishers made the last hundred feet slung over the shoulder of a Sherpa, I don't know if it's talking movies, the radio, the coming of telly, or what. Possibly all three. But we got away from real heroes. They're not exciting enough telly actors can do it better real heroes are apt to be on the dull side they're men who do things rather than being showmen actually most adventure can be on the monotonous side nine-tenths of the time when a stanley goes to find livingston he doesn't spend twenty-four hours a day killing rogue elephants or fighting off tribesmen most of the time he's plodding along in the swamps getting bitten by mosquitoes or through the bush getting bitten by tsetse flies. So, as a people, we turned it over to the movies and telly, where they can do it better. Joe Mauser's mind was working now, but he held silent. Fred Soligen went on. Your typical fracas buff, glued to his telly set, wants two things. First, lots of gore, lots of blood, lots of sadistic thrill and the lower, lower lads who are silly enough to get into the military category for the sake of glory, or a few shares of common stock they might secure, provide that gore. Second, your telefans want some good guys, whose first requirement is to be easily recognized, some heroes easily identified with. Anybody can tell a telehero when he sees one, handsome, dashing, distinctively uniformed, preferably tall and preferably blonde and blue-eyed, though we'll eliminate those requirements in your case if you'll grow a mustache. He cocked his head to one side. Yes, sir, a very dashing mustache. Joe said sourly, You think that's all I need to hit the big time? A dashing mustache, eh? No, Fred Soligen said very slowly and evenly. We're also going to need every bit of stock you've accumulated, Major. We're going to have to buy your way into the columns of the Fracas Buff magazine. We're going to have to bribe my colleagues, the telecamera crews, to keep you on lens when you're looking good, and more important still, off when you're not. We're going to have to spend every credit you've got. 
I see, Joe said. And when it's all been accomplished, what do you get out of this, Fred? Fred Soligen laid it on the line. When it's all been accomplished, you'll be an upper. I'm ambitious too, Joe. Just as ambitious as you are. I need an in. You'll make it. I'll make it. I have the know-how. I can do it. When you've made it, you'll make me. End of chapter one of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Chapter two of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. When Major Mauser escorting Dr. Nadine Hare, daughter of the late Baron Hare of vacuum tube transport, entered the swank exclusive room of the greater Washington branch of the Ultra Hotels, the orchestra ceased the dreamy dance music it had been playing and struck up the lilting the girl i left behind me as they followed the maitre de hotel to their table nadine frowned in puzzled memory and after they were seated she said that piece where have i heard it before joe cleared his throat uncomfortably an old marching song come down from way back popular during the civil war the seventh cavalry rode forth to that tune on the way to their rendezvous with the sioux at the little bighorn she frowned at him puzzled still you seem to know an inordinate amount about a simple tune joe then she said why now i remember where i've heard it recently wednesday when i was waiting for you at the agora bar the band played it when you entered he picked up a menu hurriedly the exclusive room was ostentatious to the point of having menus and waiters what'll you have nadine he still wasn't quite at ease with her first name offhand he could never remember having been on a first name basis with a mid upper certainly not one of the female gender but she was not put off why joe mauser you've acquired a theme song or whatever you call it I didn't know you were that well known among the nitwits who follow the fracases. Why, next they'll be forming those ridiculous buff clubs. Her laughter tinkled. The Major Joe Mauser Club. Joe flushed. As a matter of fact, there are three, he said unhappily. One in Mexico City, one in Bogota, and one in Portland. I've forgotten if it's Oregon or Maine she was puzzled still and ignored the waiter who standing there made joe nervous establishments that boasted live waiters were rare enough in joe mauser's experience that he could easily remember the number of occasions he attended them nadine hare to the contrary an hereditary aristocrat born was totally unaware of the flunky's presence and would remain so until she required him she looked at Joe from the side of her eyes, suspiciously. That new mustache, which gives you such a romantic air. Your new uniform, very gallant. You look like one of those imperial hussars or something. And your tele-interviews. By a stretch of chance I saw one of them the other day. That master of ceremonies seemed to think you were the most dashing soldier since Jeb Stewart. Joe said to the waiter, champagne please that worthy said apologetically may i see your credit card major the exclusive room is limited to upper nadine said coldly the major is my guest i am dr nadine har her voice held the patina of those to the manner born and not to be gainsay the other bowed hurriedly murmured something placatingly and was gone there was a tick in the side of Joe's mouth, which usually manifested itself only in combat. He said stiffly, I am afraid we should have gone to a middle establishment. Nonsense! What difference does it make? Besides, don't change the subject. I am not to be fooled, Joe Mauser. Something is afoot. Now, just what? The tick had intensified. Joe Mauser looked at the woman he loved realizing that it could never occur to her that he a mid-middle would presume to think in terms of wooing her that even in her supposed scorn of rank 
privilege, and status, she was still, subconsciously perhaps, a noble, and he a serf. Evolution there was in society, and the terms were different, but it was still a world of class distinctions, and she was the ruling class, and he the ruled, she a patrician, he a pleb. His voice went very even, very flat, almost as if he were speaking to a foe. When we first met, Nadine, I told you that I had been born a mid-lower. Why, I don't know, but from my earliest memories I revolted against the strata in which birth placed me. History. I have had a lot of time to read history in hospital beds. Tells me that there have been few socio-economic systems under which the strong, intelligent, aggressive, cunning, or ruthless couldn't work their way to the top. Very well, I intend to do it under people's capitalism. Industrial feudalism, she murmured. Call it what you will. I won't be happy until I'm a member of that one percent on top. She looked into his face. Are you sure you will be, then? I don't know, he said angrily, but I've heard the arguments before. It's been used down through the ages by apologists for the privileged classes. Pity the poor rich man. While the happy slaves are sitting down at the levee, strumming their banjos, the poor plantation owner is up in his mansion, drowning his sorrows in mint juleps. She had an edge of anger, too. All right, she snapped. But I'll tell you this, Joe Mauser. The world is out of gear but the answer isn't for individuals to better their material lot by jumping their caste statuses. The waiter brought their wine, and both angry, both held their peace until he had served it and left. What is the answer, he said, mock in his voice. It's easy enough for you on top to tell me below that the answer isn't in making my way to your level. She was interrupted in her hot reply by a rolling of the orchestra's drums and the voice of a domineering m c who managed effectively to drown all vocal opposition at the tables grinning inanely holding on to his portable wireless mic he babbled along about the wonderful people present tonight and the good time being had by all the exclusive room being founded on pure snobbery he made great to do about the celebrities present this politician that actress, this currently popular songstress, that baron of industry. Joe and Nadine ignored most of his chatter, still glaring at each other, until he came to, and those among us who are fracas buffs, and who isn't a fracas buff these days, given the merest drop of red blood. Fracas buffs will be thrilled to know that they are spending the evening in the company of the intrepid Major Joseph Mauser. Behind him, the orchestra broke into the quick strains of The Girl I Left Behind Me, whose most recent act of sheer military genius and daring do combined resulted in his all but single-handedly winning the fracas between Continental Hovercraft and the vacuum tube transport, and thus inflicting defeat upon none other than Major Stonewall Cogswell for the first time in more than a decade. The MC babbled on now about another present celebrity, a retired pugilist, once a champion. Nadine looked into his face. I think I understand now. You mentioned that in any society. How did you put it? The strong, intelligent, aggressive, cunning, or ruthless could work their way to the top. You've tried strength, intelligence, and aggressiveness, haven't you, Joe? They didn't work. At least not fast enough. So now you're giving cunning a try. Will ruthlessness be next, Joe Mauser? He was saved an answer. A hulking body in evening wear stood next to their table, swaying. Joe looked up into a face glazed by either trank or alcohol. He didn't know the other man, and for a moment failed to realize the other's purpose. The man was mumbling something that didn't come through. Joe, irritated, said, what in Zen do you want? The stranger shook his head as though to clear it. He sneered, The famous Joe Mauser, eh? 
the brave soldier boy well let me tell you something soldier boy you don't look so tough to me with your cute little mustache and your fancy pants uniform you look like a molly to me that's too bad joe bit out and now if you'll just go away he turned his face from the other joe nadine said in an alarmed warning the other's contemptuous cuff unsuspected nearly bowled joe completely from his chair as it was he barely caught himself his attacker shuffled backwards and joe recognized the trained steps of the professional boxer the other's identity came to him although he was no follower of pugilism a sport largely out of favor since the rapid growth of tele scanned fracases boxing at its top had never been more than an inadequate replacement of the games once held in the roman arena joe was on his feet instantly the fighting man under attack the table that he and nadine occupied was a ringside one and in open view of half the room but that meant nothing he was under attack and for the nonce surprised on the defensive how do you like them apples soldier boy the professional pugilist chuckled nastily his left flicked forward and joe barely avoided its connecting with his face he threw aside for the time any attempt to explain the other's uncalled-for aggression unless he did something and quick he was going to be a laughing-stock rather than the hero into which fred soligen was trying to build him nadine said anxiously joe please the waiters will deal with he didn't hear her joe mauser with all his hospital studies had never heard of the marcus of queensbury but even if he had it would never have occurred to him to be bound by that arbiter of fisticuffs in fact he had no intention even of being restricted to the use of his hands as fists the japanese long centuries before had proven the fist less than the most effective manner in which to pursue hand-to-hand -hand combat joe mauser working coolly fast and ruthlessly now a trained combat man exercising his profession moved in for the kill his shoulders hunched slightly forward his hands forward into the sides choppers rather than sledges joe stepped closer as quickly as a jungle cat his left hand leapt forward to the other's neck hacked came back into another blurring swing hacked again his opponent grunted agony but a man does not become heavyweight champion without being able to take as well as give punishment joe's attacker tucked his chin into his shoulder fighter style and moved in throwing off the effects of the karate blows somehow he seemed considerably less drunk or overtranked than he had short moments before and there was rage in his face rather than glaze one of the blows caught joe on the shoulder and sent him reeling back at the same time behind the other joe could see the maitre de hotel flanked by three waiters hurrying up he was going to have to do something and do it quickly or be branded a boorish middle who had intruded into a domain of the uppers only to participate in a brawl and have to be expelled by the establishment's servants the former champ his eyes narrowed in confidence of victory came boring in on his toes quick for all his bulk joe turned sideways his movements lithe he lashed out with his right foot at this angle getting double the leverage he would have otherwise and caught the other on the kneecap the pugilist bent forward in agony his mouth opening as though in protest joe stepped forward quickly and efficiently his hands were now knitted together in a huge double fist he brought them upward crushingly into the opponent's face with all the force he could achieve and felt bone and cartilage crush before even waiting for the other to fall he turned righted his chair and resumed his seat facing nadine his breath coming only inconsiderably faster than before her eyes were wide but she hadn't organized herself as yet to the point of either protest or praise the maitre d was at their table sir he began joe said curtly this barroom brawler attacked me i'm surprised you allow your patrons to get into the shape he is please bring us our bill the head waiter stuttered his eyes going about in despair 
even as his assistants were lifting the fallen champion to his feet and hustling him away an occupant of one of the nearby tables spoke up collaborating joe's words the action had been fast though brief and had won the fascinated attention of that half of the patrons of the exclusive room near enough to see someone else called out too and it came to joe cynically that a brawl in an establishment exclusive to uppers differed little from one of middle or even lower caste but it was impossible that they remain he had looked forward to this evening with nadine hare had planned to lay the foundations for a future campaign when as a newly created upper he would be in a position to mention marriage he fumed inwardly even as he helped her with her wrap preparatory to leaving nadine now that she had recovered composure said coldly i suppose you realize you broke that man's nose and injured his eye to an extent i'd have to examine him to evaluate behind her he rolled his eyes upward in mute protest he said what was i supposed to do hand him a rose from our table bouquet violence is the last resort of the incompetent you must tell that sometime to a jungle animal being attacked by a lion oh you're impossible the end of chapter two of frigid fracas by mac reynolds Chapter Three of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. When Fred Soligen entered his living room, he automatically switched off the telly screen, which was the entire north wall. The room's lights automatically went brighter. His perpetual air of sour cynicism was absent as he chuckled to the room's sole inhabitant. What? A son of mine gawking at telly? Next, I'll find tranks by the bowlful sitting on the tea table his son grinned at him already at the age of sixteen samuel soligen was a good three inches taller than his father at least ten pounds heavier the boy was bright-eyed toothy of smile gawky as only a teenager can be gawky and obviously the proverbial apple of his father's eye sam said the faintest note of apology in his tone just finished my assignments papa thought i'd see if there was anything worthwhile on the air an incredible optimist freddy chuckled you take after your mother believe me sam there is nothing worthwhile on telly not even when you're casting especially when i'm casting boy what have you been getting at temple school these days zan i've been so busy on a special project i've been working on I haven't had time to keep check on whether or not you're even still living there. The boy shrugged, picked up an apple from the sideboard, and began to munch. His voice was disinterested. Ah, uh, comparative religion mostly. We gotta go way back and study about the Greeks and the triple goddesses, and then the Olympians. All that crud. Hey, watch your language, Sam. Remember, you're going to wind up a priest. Yeah, the boy grumbled. That'll be the day. Have you ever heard of a lower becoming a full priest? I'll be lucky if I get to monk. Fred Soligen sat down suddenly across from his son. His voice lost its edge of good-natured humor and became deadly serious. Listen, son, you were born a high lower just like your father. Unfortunately, I wasn't jumped to low middle until after your birth, and you're not going to stay a high lower any more than I'm going to stay a low middle. The boy shrugged, his expression almost surly now. Ah, what difference does it make? High lower isn't too bad. It's sure better than low lower. I've got enough stock issued me for anything I'll ever need, or if not, I can work a while, just like you've done and earn a few more shares fred soligen's face worked in alarm hey sam listen here we've been over this before but maybe not as thoroughly as we should have sure this people's capitalism on the top of the welfare state they've got all sorts of fancy names to call it you've got cradle to grave security 
Instead of waiting for old age, or thirty years of service, or something, to get your pension, it starts at birth. At long last, the jerks have inherited the earth. The boy said plaintively, as though in objection to his father's sneering words, You aren't talking against the government or the old-time way of doing things, are you, Papa? What's wrong with what we got? Everybody's got it made. Nobody has to... His father was impatiently waving a hand at him in negation. No, everybody doesn't have it made. Almost everybody's bogged down. That's the trouble, Sam. The guts have been taken out of us. And ninety-nine people out of a hundred don't care. They've got bread and butter security. They've got Trank to keep them happy. And they've got the fracases to watch, the sadistic, gory death of others to keep them amused and their minds off what's really being done to them. We're not part of that ninety-nine out of a hundred, Sam. We're two of those who aren't jerks. We're on our way up out of the mob, to where life can be full. Got it, son? A full life. Doing things worth doing. Thinking things worth thinking. Associating with people who have it on the ball. He had come to his feet in his excitement, and was pacing before the boy who sat now, mouth slightly agape at his father's emphasis. Sam, listen, I'm getting along, already in my forties, and I never did get much education back when I was your age. Maybe I'll never make it, but you can. That's why I insisted you switch categories. You were born into communications like me, but you've switched to religion. Why'd you think I wanted that? Ah, I don't know, Papa. I thought maybe... His father snorted. Look, son, I haven't spent as much time with you as I should, especially since your mother left us. She just couldn't stand what she called my being against everything. She was one of the jerks, Sam. You oughtn't to talk about my mother that way, Sam said sullenly. All right, all right. I just meant that she was willing to spend her life sucking on Trank, watching Telly, and living on a pittance income from the inalienable stock shares issued her at birth. But let's get to this religious curd. Son, whatever con man first thought up the idea of gods put practically the whole human race on the sucker list. You say they're giving you comparative religion in your classes at the temple now, eh? Okay, have you ever heard of a major religion where the priests didn't do just fine for themselves? But, Papa, well, shocks, there's always been. Certainly, certainly, individuals, crackpots, usually out of tune with the rest of the priesthood. But the rank and file do pretty well for themselves. Didn't you point out earlier that a lower in our society never makes full priest? Not to speak of bishop or ultra bishop. They're uppers, part of the ruling hierarchy. Well, what's all this got to do with me getting into category religion? I'd think it'd be more fun in communications, like you. Gee, Papa, going around meeting all those famous... Fred Soligen's face worked. Look, son, sure, I meet a lot of people on top. But the thing is, eventually you're going to become one of those people, not just interview them. He began pacing again in nervous irritation. Sam, those on top want to stay there, like always. They freeze things so they and their kids will remain on top. In our case, they've made it all but impossible for anybody to progress from the caste they were born in. Not impossible, but almost. They've got to allow a man with extraordinary ability, like, to bust out to the top if he's got it on the ball. Otherwise, there'd be an explosion. That's not the way they say in school. It sure isn't. The story is that anybody can make upper upper if he has the ability. But the thing is, Sam, you can't just make a jerk realize he's a jerk. If he sees somebody else rising cast, he can't see why he shouldn't. That's why real rising has been restricted to category military and category religion. In the military, a man gives up his security, obviously, and if he's a jerk, he dies. In category religion, they've got another way to sort out the jerks and make sure they never get further than monk 
and beyond the caste of high lower gods always work in mysterious ways and anybody in category religion who doesn't have faith in the wisdom of god's mysterious choices of who to ordain and who to reject obviously shows that he has not really got the true faith which is of course essential to a priest not to speak of a bishop or ultra bishop so obviously the gods were wise in rejecting him in simpler words the would-be priest who simply hasn't got what it takes can be given the heave ho without it being necessary for him or his family or friends to understand why that's all very simple he lacked the humility essential in a priest of the gods as proven by his rebellious reaction sam said unhappily i don't get all this fred zoligen came to a pause before the boy sat down again abruptly and patted his son's knee you're young sam too young to understand some of it trust your father stick to your studies now you have to get the basic gobbledygook but you're on your way up the ladder son i've got a deal cooking that's going to give us an in can't tell you about it now but it's going to mean an important break for us it was then that the door announced major joseph mauser calling on frederick soligen end of chapter three Chapter Four of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Joe Mauser shook hands with the telly reporter in an abrupt, impatient manner. Fred said, "Major, I'd like to introduce my son, Samuel. Sam, this is Major Joe Mauser. You don't follow the fracases, but the major's one of the best mercenaries in the field." Sam scrambled to his feet and shook hands. "Gee, Joe Mauser." Joe looked at him questioningly. I thought you didn't follow the fracases. Sam grinned awkwardly. Well, gee, you can't miss picking up some stuff about the fighting. All the other guys are buffs. Joe said to Freddy, Could I speak to you alone? Certainly, certainly. Sam, run along while the Major and I have business. When the boy was gone, Joe sank into a chair and looked up at the telly reporter accusingly. He said, This fancy uniform I stood still for. That idea of picking up a song to identify me with and bribing the orchestra leaders to swing into it whenever I entered some restaurant or nightclub might have its advantages. Getting me all sorts of tele interviews between fracases and all those write ups in the fracas buff magazines I can see the need for, in spite of what it's costing. But what in Zen, his voice went dangerous was the idea of sticking that punch-drunk prize-fighter on me in the most respectable nightclub in greater Washington. Freddy grinned ruefully. Oh, you figured that out, eh? Did you think I was stupid? Freddy rubbed his hands together happily. He used to be world champion, and you flattened him. It was in every gossip column in the country. Every news reporter played it up. And hell, it only cost us five shares of your vacuum tube transport stock five shares why not he used to be champ now he's so broke he's got to live on stock he isn't allowed to sell his basic government issue at birth he was willing to take a dive cheap if you ask me joe growled at him unhappily i've got news for you freddy your hired brawler started off as per instructions evidently but after a couple of blows had been exchanged his slap happy brain lost the message and he tried to take me we're lucky he didn't splatter me all over the dance floor of the exclusive club he didn't take a dive i had to scuttle him freddy blinked san sure 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 joe growled look next time you decide to spend five shares of my stock on some deal like this let me know eh freddy walked to the sideboard and got a glass whiskey he said Tequila, if you've got it, Joe said. Look, I'm beginning to have second thoughts about this campaign. Where's it got us, so far? Freddy brought the fiery Mexican drink and handed it to him, and took a place on the chair opposite. His voice was very persuasive. It's going fine. You're on everybody's lips. 
First thing you know, some of the armament firms will be having you endorse their guns, swords, cannons, or whatever. Oh, great, Joe growled. Already my friends are ribbing me about this fancy uniform and all the plugs I've been getting. The glory grabber isn't any more popular today among real pros than he's ever been. Who gives a damn? Freddy sneered cynically. You're not in this for your lame brain mercenary pals with their soldier of fortune codes of behavior. We're in this for number one, Joe Mauser, and number two, Freddy Soligen. Joe put away the greater part of his drink. Sure, sure, sure. But where are we now? Your campaign has been in full swing for months. What's accomplished? The small telly reporter was indignant. What's accomplished? We've got three major Joe Mauser buff clubs in full swing, and five more starting. And next month you're going to be on the cover of Fracas Times. I'm still a major, and still mid-middle cast, and my stock shares available for bribery are running short. Freddy twisted his mouth and looked worriedly down into his glass. He said unhappily, We need a gimmick to climax all this. Some kind of gimmick to bring you absolutely to the top. A gimmick? Joe demanded. What do you mean, a gimmick? You're going to have to do something really spectacular. Make you the biggest telly hero of them all. We'll have to get you into a real fracas and pull something dramatic. I don't know what. I don't seem to be able to come up with an angle. But when I do, I guarantee that every telly camera covering the fracas will be zeroed in on Joe Mauser. Great, Joe growled. I've got just the gimmick. It'll wow him. The telly reporter looked up hopefully. I'll get killed in a burst of glory, Joe said. End of chapter four. Recording by Dale Grothman. Chapter five of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. A servant took Joe Mauser's cap at the door and requested that Joe follow him. Joe trailed behind on the way to the living room of the mansion, somewhat taken aback by the, to him, ostentation of the display of luxuries of yesteryear. Among them was to be numbered the butler. Servants, other than military batmen, were simply not in Joe's world. Only the uppers were in a position to utilize the full time of individuals. Long years passed, those tasks which once called for servants had been automated, from automated elevators to automated babysitters. The servant announced him, and then seemingly disappeared in the brief moment while Joe was bowing formally over Nadine Hare's hand. Even while murmuring the appropriate banalities, Joe wondered how one acquired the ability to seemingly disappear once one's services were no longer needed. Every man to his own trade, he decided. He had a date with Nadine, but it turned out that the piquant upper was not alone. In fact, it was obvious that she had not yet got around to dressing for her appointment with Joe. He had promised to take her soaring in his sailplane. She was attired, as always, as those who dress have never considered the cost of clothing. And, as ever, when Joe saw her newly, after a period of days or more away, he was taken with her intensity and her almost brittle beauty. What was it that the aristocrat seemed able to acquire after but a generation or two of what they were pleased to call reading? That aloof quality, that exquisite gentility. Joe, she said, you'll be pleased to meet Philip Howard, category government, rank secretary. Phil, Major Joe Mauser. The other, possibly forty, shook hands firmly and looked into Joe's face. He had a crisp manner. Good heavens, yes, he said. That remarkable innovation of using the engineless aircraft for reconnaissance. My old friend Marshal Cogswell was speaking of it the other day. I assume that in advance you purchase stock in the firms which manufacture such craft, Major. They must be booming. Joe grimaced wryly. No, sir. I was not smart enough to think of that. 
professional soldiers are traditionally stupid what was the old expression they can take their shirts off without unbuttoning their collars philip holland cocked his head even as he chuckled i detect a note of bitterness major nadine said airily joe has ambitions thinking the answer to all his problems lie in jumping his cast to upper joe looked at her impatiently to where she sat on the mid twentieth century type sofa philip holland said possibly he's right my dear each of us have different needs to achieve such happiness as is possible to man to joe he sounded just vaguely on the stuffy side even through the crispness by nature nervous and quick moving holland seemed to try and project an air of calm which didn't quite come off joe wondered what his relationship to nadine could be a twinge of jealousy there but that was ridiculous nadine must be in the vicinity of thirty obviously she knew and had known many men as attracted to her as was joe mauser and men in her own caste at that somehow though he felt holland was no upper the other simply didn't have the air joe said to him nadine doesn't get my point i contend that in a strata divided society it's hard to realize yourself fully until you're a member of the upper caste admittedly perhaps you won't even if you are such a member but at least you haven't the obstacles with which the lower class or classes are beset interestingly stated holland said briskly he returned to his chair from which he had arisen to shake hands with joe and looked at nadine you said on introducing us that joe would be glad to meet me my dear why especially nadine laughed because i've been practicing your arguments upon him both of the men frowned at her nadine looked at joe phil holland's the most interesting man i know i do believe he's secretary to marlowe mannerheim the minister of foreign affairs and simply couldn't be more privy to the inner workings of government it was phil who convinced me that something was wrong with our socio-economic system oh joe said he wasn't really interested let society solve its problems he had his own and they were sufficient unto themselves as well as the day thereof however conversation has to be kept moving he needled the other i've heard it contended that any type of government is good given capable intelligent personnel to run it or bad if not so managed what was the example i read somewhere both heaven and hell are despotisms phil holland shrugged an interesting observation however institutions including socio-political ones can become outdated when they do no matter how intelligent capable and honest the governmental heads that socio-political system can be a hell if at such time there are capable intelligent persons available they will take such measures as are necessary to change the institutions nadine came to her feet the subject is my favorite but i must change joe is taking me a gliding and i'm sure this frock isn't de rigueur you gentlemen will excuse me she was off before they had time to come to their feet joe mauser settled himself again crossing his legs he said idly and you think our basic institutions have reached the state of needing change perhaps although as a member of the government category it should hardly be my position to advocate such he seemed to switch subjects have you read much of the roman ludi the games as we call them the gladiators and such joe shrugged i've read a bit about them it's been pointed out in fact by dr hare among others that basically our present-day fracases serve the same purpose that instead of bread and circuses provided by the roman patricians to keep the unemployed roman mob from becoming restive we give them trank pills and televiolence mm, holland nodded but that isn't the point i was making right now what i was thinking was that the first roman games were athletic affairs without bloodshed it wasn't until 264 b c that three pairs of slaves were sent to fight with swords by 183 b c the number had gone to sixty pairs by 145 b c 
Ninety pairs fought for three days. But that was just the beginning. They really got underway with the dictators. Sulla put a hundred lions into the arena, but Julius Caesar topped that with four hundred, and Pompey then had six hundred, plus over four hundred leopards and twenty elephants. Augustus beat them all with three thousand five hundred elephants and ten thousand men killed in a series of games. But it was the emperors who really expanded the Luddy. Trajan had ten thousand animals killed in the arena to celebrate his victory over the Dacians, not to mention eleven thousand people, not to speak of hippopotami, tigers, lions, and leopards. Few people realize the extent to which the Romans went to acquire exotic animals to be slaughtered for the edification of the mob. They penetrated as far south as Kenya. There are still the ruins of a Roman fort there, as far east as Indonesia, as far north as the Baltic, and there is even evidence that they brought polar bears from Iceland. Phil Holland snorted, as though in contempt. But the mob wearied of even such spectacles as giraffes being killed by pygmies from the Iturbi forest. The game started as fights between skilled swordsmen being observed by knowledgeable combat soldiers of a warrior people. But as the Romans lost their warlike ardor and became a worthless mob performing no useful act for either themselves or the state, they no longer appreciated a drawn-out duel between equals. They wanted quick blood, and lots of it, and turned to mass slaughter of Christians, runaway slaves, criminals, and whoever else they could find to throw to the lions, crocodiles, or whatever. Even this became old hat, and they turned increasingly to more extreme sadism. Children were hung up by their heels, and animals turned loose to pull them down. Men were tied face to face with rotting corpses, and so remained until death. Animals were taught to rape virgins. Joe Mauser stirred again. What in Zen was this long monologue on the Roman games leading to? Holland said, By the way, contrary to some belief, the games didn't end upon Christianity becoming the dominant faith, and finally the state religion. Constantine legalized Christianity in 313 AD, but it wasn't until 365 that Valentinian passed a law against sacrificing humans to animals in the arena, and the gladiator schools remained in operation until 399. The arenas were finally closed in 404 AD, but by that time the Roman Empire was a mockery. In all, they lasted more than half a millennium, but things move faster these days. The tone of voice changed abruptly, and Holland snapped a question at Joe. By your age, I would imagine you've participated in present-day fracases for some 15 years. How have they changed in that time? Joe was taken aback. Why, he said, hesitated as he got the other's point, then went on, nodding. Yes, they used to be a company size, a few hundred lads involved. After a while, a battalion-sized fracas became fairly commonplace. Then, about ten years ago, a corporation of any size had to be able to put at least a regiment onto the field, and the biggies had brigades. And now, Holland urged, now a divisional-sized fracas is the thing. Yes, and if the corporation isn't among the top dozen or so, a single defeat can mean bankruptcy. Joe nodded. He had known of such cases. Holland leaned back in his chair, as though all his points had been made. He said, his voice less brisk, Our people's capitalism, our welfare state, took the road of bringing the equivalent of the Roman Ludi to keep our people in a state of stupefied acceptance of the status quo. And, as in the case of Rome, the games are bankrupting it. Our present-day patrician classes, our uppers, have a tiger by the tail, Joseph Mauser, and can't let go. We need those capable and intelligent people of whom you spoke earlier to make some basic changes. Where are they? Nadine says that your great driving ambition is to jump to upper in castes. But even if you make it, what will you have on your hands but these problems that the uppers seem unable to solve? Joe said, impatiently, Possibly you're right, 
What you say about the fracases becoming bigger and more expensive is true. They're also becoming bloodier. In the old days, a corporation or a union going into a fracas was conscious of having a high casualty list among the mercenaries. Highly trained soldiers cost money. Insurance, indemnity, pensions, all the rest of it. Consequently, you'd fight a battle of movement, maneuver, brainwork on the part of the officer commanding, so that practically nobody was hurt on either side. One force or the other would surrender after being caught in an impossible situation. Not any more. These days they want blood, plenty of blood, and they want the telecameras to focus right into the middle of it. Joe shook his head. But it's not my problem to solve. I've got my goal. I'll worry about other ones when I've achieved it. A voice behind him was supercilious. I do believe it's a status-hungry captain, uh, that is, Major these days. To what do I owe this unexpected visit, Major Mauser? Joe came to his feet and faced the newcomer, Philip Holland doing the same somewhat more leisurely. Baron Balt Hare, wearing a colonel's uniform and flickering his swagger stick along his booted leg, stood in the doorway. His voice was lazily arrogant. And, Mr. Holland, I must say the middle caste seemed to have taken over the house. Well, Major Mauser, I assume you do not labor under the illusion that you are welcome in this dwelling. In category military, rank is observed whilst in uniform, even though neither individual is currently on active service. Joe had automatically come to attention. He said stiffly, Sir, I am calling upon your sister, Dr. Hare. Indeed, Baron Hare said, his nostrils high in that attitude once perfected by the grandees of medieval Spain, landed gentry of England, and Prussian junkers. I find that my sister, in her capacity as a medical scientist, seems to go to extremes in her research. What aspect of the lower classes is she studying in your case, Major? Joe flushed. Baron Hare, he said. We seem to have gotten off on the wrong foot when we participated in that fracas against Continental Hovercraft under your father, the late Baron. I would appreciate an opportunity to start over again. Would you indeed, Balt Hare said loftily. He turned his eyes to Philip Holland, whose mouth bore the slightest suggestion of suppressed humor. Unless I am mistaken, the conversation at the time of my entry seemed to have a distinctly subversive element. Shouldn't this be somewhat surprising in a secretary of the administration's foreign ministry? Philip Holland said crisply, You must have intruded, um, that is, entered, at the end of a sentence, Baron Hare. We were merely discussing the various methods down through the ages that ruling classes have utilized to perpetuate themselves in power. Hare obviously disbelieved him. He said, For example? There are many examples, Holland said, reseating himself. For instance, the medieval feudal classes, who dominated the ignorant and highly superstitious serfdom, soon found it expedient to add to their titles, by the grace of God, as though it was God's wish that they be count, or baron, or prince, or king. What serf would dare attempt to overthrow his lord in the face of God's wishes? I see, Baltair said. And other examples? Holland shrugged. The Chinese mandarins utilize possibly the most unique method of a governing class perpetuating itself ever known, certainly one of the most gentle. Hare was scowling at him, obviously out of his depth, as was Joe Mauser, for that matter. Holland said crisply, the mandarins devised a written language so complicated that it took at least ten years to master reading and writing, thus assuring that only the very well-to-do could afford to educate their sons. When invaded, as so often China has been invaded, only the mandarins were in a position to serve the conquerors by carrying on the paperwork so vital to any advanced society. So, still in control of the machinery of government, they continued to perpetuate themselves. And shortly, as history is reckoned, we found the conquerors assimilated, 
and the Mandarin's still in power. Balt Hare said impatiently, I seem to be under the impression that you were speaking of more current times when I entered, Mr. Holland. From the door, Nadine said, Good heavens, Balt, are you badgering my guests again? The three men faced her. Balt said nastily, I'm astonished that you persist in bringing members of the lower orders into my home, Nadine. Our home, Balt. In fact, if you must bring up such matters before outsiders, you will recall that you converted your portion of the family estate into continental hovercraft stock shortly before father met Baron Zwerdling's forces in the recent fracas. No wonder you dislike Major Mauser. Through his efforts, our company won, rather than losing, as you had expected. Her brother, who could have been only slightly her senior, was obviously enraged. Are you suggesting that I am not welcome to stay in this, our family home, simply because the property is in your name? Not at all, she sighed. You are always at home here, Balt. I simply demand that you exercise common courtesy to my guests. He turned and walked stiff-kneed from the room. Sorry, Joe said to Nadine. Why, she said simply. The fact of the matter is that Balt and I are continually at each other. He is quite the active member of the Nathan Hale Society. Joe frowned his ignorance and looked at Holland. Holland chuckled. An ultra-conservative, reactionary might be a better term, organization devoted to witch-hunting and such in its efforts to maintain the status quo, Major. Once again, history repeats itself. Such groups invariably evolve when basic change threatens the socio-economic system. He looked at Nadine. I must be going, my dear. My, how charming you look. If this is the customary garb whilst going a-gliding, I shall have to take up the sport. Why, Phil, inane words of flattery from serious old you? Joe squirmed inwardly, wondering again upon what basis was the friendship of Nadine Hare and Philip Holland. The butler entered and said, A call for Major Mauser, if you please. Only Max Mance, his batman during his last fracas, and now permanently attached to Joe, knew that he might be found at this address. Joe said to Nadine, Would you pardon me for a moment? I assume it's something important, or I wouldn't be disturbed. She said demurely, Undoubtedly one of the feminine members of the Joe Mauser Buff Club. He snorted amusement and followed the butler to the library and the telescreen. Max Mant's face loomed in the viewing screen. As soon as Joe appeared, he said, Major, sir, the marshal's been trying to get a hold of you ever since you left the hotel. The marshal? Joe scowled. Marshal Cogswell, that one they called Stonewall Cogswell. And when he wants somebody, he really wants them. And I've got a feeling it's a good idea to come on the double. Joe laughed. Stonewall Cogswell's a tough one, all right, Max. You ain't just counting down, Major, sir. He said when I get hold of you to come over to his headquarters soonest. All right, Max, thanks. Joe flickered the set off. Actually, Max was right. You didn't ignore a summons from Marshal Cogswell. Not if you were in category military and ambitious. The date with Nadine was off and just when he was beginning to detect signs of her meeting him on his own level. Are you surprised at my memory? The subject has always fascinated me. For one thing, I am a great believer in the theory that history repeats itself. As time went on, arenas were built all over the empire. Even small towns boasted their own. In Rome, the number of them grew so that eventually an avid follower could attend every day the year round, and as they increased in quantity, they also had to grow more extreme to hold the fans' attention. The Emperor Philip, in celebrating the thousandth anniversary of the founding of Rome, had killed a thousand pair of gladiators, a rhinoceros, six hippopotami, ten hyenas, ten giraffes, twenty wild asses, ten tigers, ten zebras, thirty leopards, sixty lions, thirty-two elephants, forty wild horses. I'm afraid I forgot the rest. 
Joe stirred in his chair. The other's personality grew on him. The crisp voice had a certain magnetic quality that made what he said important, somehow. However, Joe's interest in Roman history wasn't exactly paramount. Holland said, You wonder at what I am driving, eh? Do you realize the expense involved in getting a rhinoceros to Rome in those days? The End of Chapter 5 Recorded by Dale Grothman Chapter 6 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds It was the common practice among category military mercenaries of the highest rank to maintain skeleton staffs between those periods when they were under hire by corporations or unions. That of Marshal Stonewall Cogswell was one of the most complete, he habitually keeping upward of a hundred officers in his private uniform. It paid off, for with such a skeleton force of highly skilled professionals as a cadre, the marshal could enlist veterans for his rank and file, and whip together a trained fighting force in a fantastically short period. And nothing was so of essence as time in the present category military. For when two corporations sued for permission to meet on the military reservation for trial by combat to settle their commercial differences, the sums involved were staggering. Joe Mauser had been correct in saying that the fracases had grown even in his memory, from skirmishes involving a company or two of men, to full-fledged battles with a division or even more on either side, forty thousand men at each other's throats. So a commanding officer became noted not only for his abilities in the field, but also those of cutting financial corners, recruiting his force of mercenaries, whipping them into a unit, and getting them into the action. In fact, corporations these days invariably stated the period of time to be involved when they petitioned the category military department, perhaps a month, three weeks of which would be used for recruiting and drill, the last week for the fracas itself. Nobody could excel Marshal Cogswell in using the three weeks to best advantage. Major Joe Mauser came to attention before the desk of the lieutenant colonel of Marshal Cogswell's staff, who was acting as receptionist before the sanctum sanctorum of the field genius. He saluted and snapped, Joseph Mauser, sir, category military, ranked major, on request to see the marshal. Lieutenant Colonel Paul Warren answered the salute, but then came to his feet and grinned, while extending his hand to be shaken. He said, Good to see you again, Mauser. Hope you're in this one with us. His grin turned rueful. That trick of yours with the glider cost me a pretty penny. I'd made the mistake of wagering heavily on hovercraft. But the marshal is waiting. Right through the door, Major. See you later. Evidently, Joe decided, the marshal was recruiting for another fracas, which was why Joe had been summoned, although when a field officer of Cogswell's stature was gathering officers to command a force, he seldom called upon them. They clamored for permission to serve with him. You weren't apt to find yourself in the drill under Cogswell, and you practically never failed to collect your victory bonus. Victory was a habit. Marshal Cogswell looked up from the desk at which he sat scowling at a military chart stretched before him. The scowl disappeared, and his strong face lit with pleasure. The craggy marshal was a small man, but strongly built, clipped of voice, and with a tone that would suggest he had been born in command, had always commanded. Joe snapped to the salute, which the marshal acknowledged with a flick of his baton, then stood to shake hands. Ah, Major Mauser, bit of trouble locating you. His eyes narrowed momentarily. Trust you are not at present affiliated with any company colors. He took in Joe's uniform and scowled vaguely, not placing it. Joe said in self-deprecation, This is my own devising, sir. I thought if I were going to have to present myself to be killed for a living, that I might as well show up before the screens as distinctively as possible. I've been told that ultimately the fracas buffs make or break you in our category. 
the marshal frowned as though unhappy and possibly surprised at joe's words however he sat down again and repeated his question by merely looking at the other no sir i'm free joe said however frankly i wasn't looking for a commission right at this time cogswell stared at him mauser was a good junior officer and they'd been through a half a dozen fracases together over the years not always on the same side why not cogswell barked are you convalescing major surely you didn't manage to cop one in that last farce personal reasons sir very well cogswell growled however i'm going to attempt to sway you major would seem that i am up against it if i don't and in a manner it's your fault joe was bewildered my fault sir the older man's voice went brisk this is a situation i've been approached by the united miners to command their forces in their trial by combat with carbonaceous fuels same old issues of course contract between the union and the corporation is usually for only two years each time it comes up the union officials try to get a larger cut of the pie and the hereditary heads of carbonaceous fuels resist automatically the category military department issues a permit the fracases they've been fighting prove so popular that there'd be riots if the permit was refused frankly i'm no great admirer of the group in control of the united miners but joe was surprised enough to say why not sir the old pro mercenaries seldom concerned themselves with the issues or principles involved in a fracas they chose their side by the more mundane considerations major cogswell looked at him testily sit down joe you're not on my staff as yet at least zen take the formality when joe accepted the chair he growled again suppose you didn't know i was born in category mining no sir well i was but even as a boy this new industrial revolution was cutting the number of employees involved in the category every year that went by that's happened every year sir including my original one joe mauser was thinking so what of course cogswell rapped my objection is to what happened to the union unions were originally founded as an instinctive gathering together of employees to achieve as high a pay as they could get from an employer with the strike as their weapon but whatever the original purpose and its virtue or lack of it the union grew into something entirely different by the early and middle twentieth century such unions as the united miners grew to such a size that they themselves became some of the largest business organizations in the country and eventually they came to be run like any other business for the benefit of those who owned or controlled them the professional labor leader evolved motivated by his own interests and finally becoming in his despotic control of the union backed by goon squads and gangsters as powerful a man as was to be found in the country seldom were strikes any longer held to better the conditions of the individual union members instead the issues were contracts which allowed for fabulous sums to go into the union coffers where they were at the disposal of the union officials the marshal grunted sourly now that the whole industry of mining is all but completely automated and only a few thousand employed actively there are confounded few miners not on the unemployed lists but the union officials wax as fat as ever what with the percentages of each ton mined going to the so-called welfare funds and such he looked at joe evidently conscious that he had made an inordinately long speech for the supposedly taciturn stonewall cogswell he cleared his throat and said not that it's my affair i switch categories to military in my youth let's get to the point i've been caught napping joe that was an unlooked-for confession to come from stonewall cogswell joe said nothing waiting for more the marshal shook his baton at the younger officer by using that confounded glider of yours as a reconnaissance craft you revolutionize present warfare major act of absolute ingenuity and i admire it unfortunately i failed to realize the speed with which each professional in our category would jump upon the bandwagon and secure gliders for himself joe saw light 
Been caught short, Cogswell rapped. Short on gliders. Short on even one glider. And within a few weeks, I'm committed to a divisional size fracas. He pushed back his chair angrily. General McCord is in command of the Carbonaceous Fuels Force. Met him before, and always brought up victory only by the skin of my teeth. But this time he has two gliders. I have none. But, sir, surely you can either buy or rent several craft on the market. Confound it, it's not the machines that are unavailable, but the trained pilots to operate them. The sport hasn't been popular in half a century. Not overtly so, even then. But training a pilot, training a pilot, nonsense! The marshal was shaking his baton at him again, in indignation. A pilot won't do. He must also be a trained reconnaissance man. Must be able to follow terrain from the air. Identify military forces, both in nature and number. I need not tell you this, Major. You, above all, know the problem. It hadn't occurred to Joe, but the other was obviously right. There couldn't be more than a few dozen men in category military who could hold down both the job of pilot and reconnaissance officer. In another six months, the situation would have changed. Officers would quickly be trained. But now, as Cogswell said, he was caught short. Joe came to his feet. Sir, I'll have to consider the commission. Frankly, my plans were otherwise. Cogswell stared at him grimly. Mauser, you've always been one of the best, an old pro in every sense of the word. However, there have been some rumors going around about your ambitions. Joe said stiffly, Sir, my ambitions are my own business, whatever those rumors. Didn't say I believe them, Major. We've been together too often when the situation has pickled for me to judge you without more evidence than gossip. What I was leading up to is this. There's nothing wrong with ambition. If you see me through this, I'll do what I can toward pushing your promotion. Joe came to the salute again. Thank you, sir. I'll consider the commission and let you know by tomorrow. Cogswell flicked the baton in his nonchalant answer to salute. That will be all then, Major. End of Chapter 6 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds Recorded by Dale Grothman. Chapter 7 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Fred Solzhen wasn't at home when Joe Mauser called. The category military officer was met instead by young Sam Solzhen, clothed this day in the robes of a novitiate of the temple. Joe remembered now that Freddy had mentioned the boy was in training in category religion. Sam led him back to the living room, switched off the telescreen which had been tuned in to one of the fictionalized fracases of the past. Poor entertainment when compared to the real thing for any fracas buff, but better than nothing. In fact, it was contended by some that if you got yourself properly tranked, you could get almost as much emotion from a phony fracas as they were called, as for the genuine. Gee, sir, Sam said, Papa was supposed to be back by now. I don't know where he is. If you want to wait... Joe shrugged and picked himself a chair. He took in Sam's robes and made conversation. Study tough in the temple schools, he asked. The teenager realized that this was a make-talk question. He said, Ah, oh, not much. A lot of curd about rituals and all. You have to memorize it. Curd yet, Joe laughed. You don't sound particularly pious, Sam. Come to think of it, I suppose any child of Freddy's could hardly be. Sam said, his young voice urgent, Papa said you were on your way up, Major Mauser, just like us. Gee, how come you chose category military instead of religion? Joe Mauser looked at the other. It was his policy to treat young people either as children or adults. If he was to deal with a teenager as an adult, he didn't believe in pulling punches any more than had he been dealing with a person of sixty. He said flatly, I've never had much regard for those categories in which a man makes his living battening on human sorrow and fear, Sam. That includes, in my book, 
such fields as religion undertakers and their affiliates and even most doctors for that matter he added to explain the last inclusion they profit too much from illness for my satisfaction major mauser was enough of a current celebrity for practically anything he said to be impressive to young sam soligen that youngster blinked he said well gee don't you believe in any gods at all if you believe in any god at all you got to have a religious category and that means priests why joe said inwardly he was amused at himself for getting into a debate with this youngster and even a trifle ashamed of needling the boy about his chosen field but he said if there are gods i doubt if they'd entrust a priesthood to threaten their created humanity with hellfire sam was taken aback well why not gods couldn't be bothered with such trivialities in fact i think it unlikely that they could be bothered with priests if i was a god certainly i couldn't the boy's face was intent its youthfulness somewhat ludicrous in view of the dark robes he wore he leaned forward yeah you talk about priests and undertakers and all that battening on human sorrow but how about you how about the category military how many men have you killed major joe winced too many he said abruptly the tick was at the side of his mouth unbeknownst to him he added but mercenaries have deliberately chosen their path they know what they're going into and they do it willingly they haven't been drafted he thought a moment and phil holland's talk about the roman looty came back to him he said it's like the difference between throwing a bunch of christians to some wild bulls in a roman arena to being a toreador in spain a matador who has chosen his profession and enters the bull ring to make money then the boy said something that gave him greater depth than joe had expected hey he said but maybe the toreador was forced into becoming a bullfighter on account of how bad he needed the money in the heat of the discussion he was emboldened to add and these new rank privates that go into a fracas not knowing what it's all about just filled with all the stuff we see on telly and all how much of a chance does one of them have if he runs into an old-timer like joe mauser out there in no man's land touche joe thought there was the action that sometimes came back to him in his dreams he had been a sergeant then but already a veteran of five years or more standing and a double score of fracases the force of which he was a member had been in full retreat and joe's squad was part of the rear guard the terrain had been mountainous the high sierra military reservation four of his men had copped one two so badly that they had to be left behind incapable of being moved joe under the pressure of long hours of retreat under fire had finally sent the others on back and found himself in a crevice near the top of the sierra which was all but impregnable his rifle had been a 4570 springfield with its ultra heavy slug but slow muzzle velocity and joe had a telescope mounted on it an innovation that barely made the requirement of predating the year 1900 and thus subscribing to the universal disarmament pact between the sov world and the west world it had taken the enemy forces a long time to even locate him a long time and half a dozen casualties that joe had coolly inflicted the way to get him the only way involved exposure joe could see the enemy officers through his scope at a distance just out of his range they knew the situation being old pros he found considerable satisfaction in the rage that he knew they were feeling he was dominating a considerable section of the front due to the terrain and there was but one way to root him out direct frontal attack they had sent in rank privates low lowers most of them in their first fracas low lowers the dregs of society seldom employed and then at the rapidly disappearing all but extinct unskilled labor low lowers most of them probably in this fracas in the hopes of the unlikelihood of so distinguishing themselves that they could be jumped a cast or at least acquire an extra share or two of common stock 
to better the basic living guaranteed by the state rank privates most of them in their first fracas unknowledgeable about taking cover and not even in the physical condition this sort of combat demanded they came in time and again surprisingly courageous joe had to admit and time and again he decimated them one by one coolly seldom wasting a shot not that he had to watch his ammunition he had the squad's full supply he estimated that before it was through he had inflicted approximately thirty casualties hits in the head in the torso the arms legs he had inflicted enough casualties to fill a field hospital and it had ended finally when a senior officer below had arrived on the scene took in the irritating situation and sent a dozen noncoms and junior officers experienced men to dig joe out joe had remained only long enough for a few final shots none of them effective at long range and had then hauled out and followed after his squad he might possibly have got two or three more of his opponents but only at his own risk besides already the irritation and hate that he had built up while on the run and while his squad mates had copped wounds had left him and there was nausea in his belly at the slaughter he had perpetrated or that time on the louisiana reservation in the fracas between allied petroleum and united oil joe had been a lieutenant then and but he rejected this trend of thought and brought his attention back to sam Sullivan. perhaps you're right he admitted some low lower jerk impressed by what he considers high pay and adventure doesn't stand much chance against an old pro the gawky teenager broke into a toothy smile gee i wasn't arguing with you major i don't know anything about it how about telling me about one of your fracases eh you know sometime you really got in the drill joe snorted he seldom met someone not of category military who didn't want a special detailed description of some gory action in which joe had participated and like all veterans of combat there was nothing he liked less to do combat was something which when done you wished to leave behind you were brainwashing really predictable it was this that you would wish to wash away but joe like others before him down through the ages had found a way out he had a store of a dozen or so humorous episodes with which he could regale listeners that time his horse's cinch had loosened when he was on a scouting mission and he had galloped around and around amidst a large company of enemy skirmishers most of them running after him and trying to drag him from the horse's back while he hung on for dear life but it occurred to him that the boy might better appreciate a tale that involved his father the telly reporter and some act of daring the small man had performed the better to serve his fracas buff audience he was well launched into the tale boosting freddy soligen's part beyond reality but not impossibly so when the worthy entered the room breaking it off while freddy was shaking hands with his visitor sam said hey papa you never told me about the time you were surrounded by all the field artillery and only you and major mauser and three other men got out fred grinned fondly at the boy and then looked his reproach at joe what are you trying to do make a life of a telly reporter sound romantic to the kid stick to the priesthood son there's more chicken dinners involved he saw joe was impatient to talk to him how about leaving us alone for a while sam we've got some business sure papa i've got to memorize some greek chants anyway how come they don't have all these rituals and all in some language everybody can understand then everybody might understand them freddy said sourly then what had happened his son said major maybe you can finish that story some other time eh joe said sure 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 it winds up with your father the hero and they bump him up to upper upper and make him head of category communications on the trank again freddy grumbled but joe sensed he wasn't particularly amused when the boy was gone joe mauser told the telly reporter of his interview with stonewall cogswell freddy shook his head 
He wants you to fly that sailplane thing of yours again, huh? No, that won't do it. We need some gimmick, Joe. Something. Joe said impatiently, You keep saying that. But look, I'm a mercenary. A fighting man can't drop out of participation in the fracases if he expects the buffs to continue interest in him. The little man tried to explain. I'm not saying you're going to drop out of the fracases, but we need something where we can make you shine, something where you can be on every lens for a mile around. Joe's face was still impatient. Freddy said sourly, Listen, you tried to handle this all by yourself last time. You dreamed up that fancy glider gimmick and sold it to old Baron Hare. But did you do yourself any good with the buffs? Like Zen you did. All you did was louse up a perfectly promising fracas, so far as they were concerned. Hardly a drop of blood was shed. Stonewall Cogswell just resigned when he saw what he was up against. Oh, sure, you won the battle of vacuum tube transport practically all by yourself. But that's not what the buff wants. He wants blood. He wants action. Spectacular action. And you can't give it to him way up there in the air. Hey! Joe looked at him, scowling questioningly. Freddy said, slowly, Why not? Joe Mauser growled. What did you mean, why not? Freddy said slowly, Why can't you have some blood and guts combat right up there in that glider. Have you gone drivel happy? But the little man was on his feet, pacing the floor quickly, irritably, and still happily. A dogfight! A natural! Listen, you ever heard about dogfights, Major? You mean pet dogs like in Wales, in the old days? No, no, in the First World War. Oh, those early fighters. Baron von Richthofen, the German? Albert Ball, the Englishman, René Funk, the Frenchman, and all the rest. Werner Voss and Ernst Udet, and Rickenbacker, and Luke Short. Joe nodded at last. I remember now. They'd have a Vickers, or a Spandau, mounted so as to fire between the propeller blades. As I recall, the German, Richthofen, had some eighty victories to his credit. Okay. They called them dogfights, one aircraft against another. You're going to reintroduce the whole thing. Joe was staring at him. Once again, the telly reporter sounded completely around the bend. Freddy was impatiently patient. We'll mount a gun on your sailplane, and you'll attack those two gliders Cogswell says General McCord has. Joe said, the Sov world observers would never stand still for it. In fact, there's a good chance that using gliders at all will be forbidden when the International Disarmament Commission convenes next month. If the Soviet delegates vote against using gliders as reconnaissance craft, the Newt World will vote with them. Those Newt World delegates vote against everything, Joe grunted. It's true enough, gliders were flown before the year 1900, but not the kind of advanced sailplanes you have to utilize for them to be practical. Certainly, there were no gliders in use capable of carrying a machine gun. Freddy demanded, Look, what was the smallest machine gun in use in 1900? Joe considered, Probably the little French chut chut gun. It was portable by one man. The rounds were carried in a flat, circular pan. I think it goes back that far. They used them in the First World War. Right. Okay, you had gliders. You had eight portable machine guns. All we're doing is combining them. It'll be spectacular. You'll be the most famous mercenary in category military, and it'll be impossible for the department not to bounce you to colonel and low upper. Especially with me, every telly reporter and fracas buff magazine we bribed yelling for it. Joe's mouth manifested its tick, but he was shaking his head. It wouldn't go anyway. Suppose I caught one or both of those other gliders, busy at their reconnaissance, and shot their tails off. So what? The fans still wouldn't have their blood and gore. We'd be so high they couldn't see the action. All they would be able to see would be the other glider falling. 
Freddy stopped dramatically and pointed a finger at him in triumph. That's where you're wrong. I'll be in the back seat of your sailplane with a portable camera. Get it? And every reporter on the ground will have the word and his most powerful telescopic lens at the ready. Man, it'll be the most televised bit of fracas of this half of the century. The end of Chapter 7 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds Read by Dale Grothman Chapter 8 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds When Major Joe Mauser entered the swank Agora Bar, the little afternoon dance band broke into a few bars of the tune which was beginning to pall him. I knew her heart was breaking, and to my heart in anguish pressed the girl I left behind me. Nadine looked up from the little table she occupied and caught the wry expression on his face and laughed. What price glory, she said. He took the chair across from her and chuckled ruefully. All right, he said. I surrender. However, if you think a theme song is bad, you'll be relieved at some of the other ideas my, um, publicity agent had, which I turned down. She said, Oh, did he want you to dash into some burning building and save some old lady's canary or something? Not exactly. However, he had a nightclub singer with a list of nine or ten victories behind her. Victories? Husbands. And I was to be seen escorting the singer around the nightclub circuit. A fate worse than death? But truly, why did you turn him down? I wanted to spend time with you. She made a mow so as to carry on our never-ending argument over the value of status no her eyes dropped and there was a slight frown on her forehead joe interpreted it to mean she took exception to one of the middle middle cast speaking to her in this wise he said flatly at least the tune is somewhat applicable tonight she looked up quickly having immediately caught the meaning of his words oh joe you haven't taken another commission why not i'm a mercenary by trade nadine he was vaguely irritated by her tone but you admittedly made a small fortune on the last fracas you were one of the very few investors in the whole country who expected vacuum tube transport to boom rather than go bankrupt he didn't bother to tell her that already the greater part of his small fortune had been siphoned off in Fred Soligen's campaign to make him a celebrity. He said, instead, The stock shares I'll make aren't particularly important, Nadine. But Stonewall Cogswell has pledged that if I'll fly for him in the carbonaceous fuel United Miners fracas, he'll press my ambition for promotion. She said, her voice low, Promotion in rank or caste, Joe? You know the answer to that but joe to risk your life your life joe for such a silly thing he said softly such a silly thing as attaining to a position which will enable me to court openly the girl i love she flushed looked into his face quickly her flush deepened and her eyes went to her folded hands on the table he said nothing nadine said finally her voice so low as almost not to be heard Perhaps I would be willing to marry a man of middle caste. He was taken with surprise, but even in thrilling to the meaning of her words, his head was shaking in negation. Nadine Hare, category medicine, rank doctor, mid upper, married to Major Joseph Mauser, category military, mid middle. Don't be ridiculous, Nadine. It would be as though back in the twentieth century you would have married a negro or an oriental she was stirred with anger there is no law preventing marriage between castes nor was there law in most states against marrying between races but there were few who dared and of those few who were allowed to be happy it's no go nadine remember in the exclusive room the other night when the waiter questioned my presence in an upper establishment 
and you had to tell him I was your guest? I don't desire to be your guest for the rest of my life, Nadine. Anger welled higher in her. And do you think that in the remote case you do jump your cast to upper, that I would marry you and then realize the rest of my life that our marriage was only possible due to your participation in mass slaughter for the sake of slobbering multitudes of telly fans? Joe said, I wasn't going to bring up the matter until I had made low upper cast. Well, sir, the matter is up. I reject you in advance. Oh, Joe, if you have to persist in this status-hungry ambition of yours, drop the category military and get into something else. You have enough of a fortune to branch into various fields where your abilities would lead to advancement. Again, he didn't tell her that his fortune was all but dissipated. Instead, he said bitterly, Those who have get. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Things are rigged these days so that it's impossible to work your way to the top, except in military and religion. Uppers take care of their own, and at the same time make every effort to keep us of the lower orders from joining their sacred circle. I might make it in the military, Nadine, but my chances in another field are so remote as to be laughable. She stood and looked down at him emptily. No, she said, don't get up. I'm leaving, Major Mauser. He began to rise, to protest, but she said, her voice curt, I have seen only one fracas on telly in my entire life, and was so repelled that I vowed never to watch again. However, I'm going to make an exception. I am going to follow this one, and if, as a result of your actions, even a single person meets death, I wish never to see you again. Do I make myself completely clear, Major Mauser? End of chapter 8 Recording by Dale Grothman Chapter 9 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds Marshal Stonewall Cogswell looked impudently around at this staff officers gathered around the chart table. Gentlemen, he said, I assume you are all familiar with the Battle of Chancellorsville. No one bothered to answer, and he chuckled. I know what you are thinking, that had any of you refrained from a thorough study of the campaigns of Lee and Jackson, he would not be a member of my staff. The craggy marshal traced with his finger on the great military chart before them. Then you will have noticed the similarity of today's dispensation of forces to that of Joseph Hooker's army at the Potomac and Lee's army of Northern Virginia on May 2nd, 1863. He pointed with his baton. Our stream here would be the Rappahannock. These woods, the wilderness. Here would be Fredericksburg and here Chancellorsville. One of his colonels nodded. My regiment occupies a position similar to that of Jubal Early. Absolutely correct, the marshal said crisply. Gentlemen, I repeat, our troop dispensations, those of Lieutenant General McCord and myself, are practically identical. Now then, if McCord continues to move his forces here, across our modern-day Rappahannock, he makes the initial mistake that finally led to the opening which allowed Jackson's brilliant 15-mile flanking march. Any questions thus far? There were some murmurs, no questions. The accumulated years of military service of this group of veterans would have totaled into the hundreds. Very interesting, eh? The marshal pursued. Jed, your artillery is massed here. It's a shame that General Jack Ulshuler has taken a commission with carbonaceous fuels. We could use his cavalry. He would be our J.E.B. Stewart, eh? Lieutenant Colonel Paul Warren cleared his throat unhappily. Sir, Jack Ulshuler is the best cavalryman in North America. I would be the last to deny it, Paul. Yes, sir. 
and he's fought half his fracases under you sir your point paul the marshal said crisply he knows your method sir for that matter so does lieutenant general mccord he's fought you enough there was silence in the staff headquarters broken suddenly by cogswell's curt chuckle paul i'm going to recommend to the category military department your promotion to full colonel on the strength of that you were the first to see what i have been getting to gentlemen do you realize what general mccord and his staff are doing this very moment i would wager my reputation that they are poring over a campaign chart of the battle of chancellorsville the craggy veteran bent back over the map again his voice dropped all humor and he stabbed with his baton here here and here they expect us to duplicate the movements of lee very good we shall but the advances of lee and jackson we will make feints and the feints made by lee and jackson will be our attacks in force gentlemen we are going to literally reverse the battle of chancellorsville major mauser joe mauser had been in the background as befitted his junior rank now he stepped to the table's edge yes sir the marshal indicated a defile were we actually duplicating the civil war battle this would have been the right flank of sedgwick's two army corps we're not dealing in army corps these days but only regiments however the position is relatively as important jack allshelter's cavalry is largely concentrated here when the action is joined he can move in one of three ways through this defile is the least likely however if his heavy cavalry does work its way through here i must know immediately this is crucial joe any questions no sir the marshal turned his attention to his chief of artillery jed when we need your guns we're going to need them badly but i doubt if that time will develop until the second or third day of the fracas going to want your guns so hidden that those two gliders of mccord's will fail to spot them the marshal grimaced in the direction of joe mauser who having his instructions had fallen back from the table again when you reintroduced aerial observation to the fracases major you set off a whole train of related factors camouflage is going to be in every field officer's lexicon from this day on which reminds me he looked at his artillerymen yes sir put your mind to work on devising maxim gun mounts to be used to keep the enemy gliders at as high an altitude as possible or preferably of course to bring them down we'll need an anti-aircraft squadron in short better put young wiley on it yes sir end of chapter nine of frigid fracas by mac reynolds recorded by dale Grothman. chapter ten of frigid fracas by mac reynolds the airport nearest to the grant memorial military reservation was some ten miles distant from its borders which upon the scheduling of a fracas were closed to all aircraft and to all persons unconnected with the fracas with the exception only of tele crews and military observers from the sov world and the newt world present to satisfy themselves that weapons of the post nineteen hundred era were not being utilized the distance however wasn't of particular importance the powered aircraft which would tow joe mauser's glider to a suitable altitude preliminary to his riding the air currents as a bird rides them would also haul him to a point just short of the military reservation's border joe mauser turned up on the opening day of the fracas which was scheduled for a period of one week or less if one or the other of the combatants was able to achieve total victory in such short order he was accompanied by fred soligen who for once was without a crew to help him with his cameras and equipment instead he sweated it out alone helped only by max mance 
who was being somewhat huffy about this tally reporter taking over his position as observer they approached the sailplane and while joe mauser checked it out in careful detail freddy Soligen and max began loading the equipment into the graceful craft's second seat immediately behind the pilot max growled how in the zen are you going to be able to lift all this weight major sir joe said absently testing the ailerons we'll make it freddy isn't any heavier than you are max besides this sailplane is a workhorse i sacrificed glide angle for weight carrying potential that meant absolutely nothing to max mance so he took it out by awarding the tele reporter with a rare combination of glower and sneer freddy said oh oh here they come joe however he kept his head low storing away his equipment and seemingly ignored the approach of the three distinctive uniformed officers joe said from the side of his mouth get that you know what out of sight soonest he turned as the trio neared came to attention and saluted the foremost of the three his tunic so small at the waist that he could only have been wearing a girdle answered the salute by tapping his swagger stick against the visor of his cap major mauser he said in acknowledgment he made no effort to shake hands turning instead to his two companions he said lieutenant colonel krishnala majumdor of bombay major mohammed kamil of alexandria may i introduce thee there was all but a giggle in his tone celebrated major joe mauser who has possibly reintroduced aircraft to warfare joe saluted and bowed in proper protocol gentlemen a pleasure the two neutrals responded correctly then stepped forward to shake his hand colonel lajos arped added gently or possibly he has not joe looked at him the hungarians seemed to make a practice of turning up every time joe mauser was about to take off the Soviet representative said airily it will be up to the international disarmament commission to decide upon that when it convenes shortly will it not the arab major was staring in fascination at the sailplane he said to joe major mauser you are sure such aircraft were in existence before nineteen hundred it would seem joe said definitely designed as far back as leonardo and flown in various countries in the eighteenth century he looked at the hungarian including so i understand what was then czarist russia the Soviet officer ignored the obvious needling and said merely it is quite true that the glider was first flown by an obscure inventor in the ukraine however that is not what particularly interests us today major perhaps the commission will find that the use of the glider is permitted for observation however it is obvious that before the year nineteen hundred by no stretch of the imagination could it be contended that they were or could have been used for say bombing he turned quickly and pointed to freddy Soligen, who already seated in the airplane was watching them his face not revealing his qualms what has that man been hiding within the craft joe said formally gentlemen may i introduce freddy Soligen, category communications subdivision tele news ranked senior reporter mr Soligen has been assigned to cover the fracas from the air freddy looked at the Soviet world officer and said innocently heidi you mean my portable camera and my power pack and my auxiliary lenses and my all right all right our pad snapped the hungarian was no fool and obviously smelled something wrong in this atmosphere he turned to joe i would remind you major that you as an individual are responsible for any deviations from the basic universal disarmament pact you and any of your superiors who can be proven to have had knowledge of such deviation i am familiar with the articles of war as detailed in the pact joe said dryly and now gentlemen i'm afraid my duty calls me he bowed stiffly saluted correctly a pleasure to make your acquaintance colonel majumder major camel colonel arped a pleasure to renew acquaintances they answered his salute and stared after him as he climbed into the sailplane 
and signaled to the pilot of the light plane which was to tow him into the air max mance ran to the tip of one wing lifted it from the ground and steadying the glider until the forward motion gave direction and buoyancy freddy soligen growled zen if they'd known i had a machine gun tucked away in this tripod case joe said unhappily the soves have obviously decided to put up a howl against the use of aircraft in the west world he shifted his hands on the stick gently and the glider which had been sliding along on its single wheel lifted ever so gently into the air joe kept it at an altitude of about six feet until the light plane was airborne freddy growled how come the hungarians have become so important in the sov world i thought it was the russians who started their whole shooting match joe said wryly that's something some of the early timers like stalin didn't figure out when they began moving in on their neighbors they could have learned a lesson from hollywood about the hungarians what was the old saying if you've got a hungarian for a friend you don't need any enemies freddy laughed even as he looked apprehensively over the sailplane's side he said yeah or that other one the hungarians are the only people who can enter a revolving door behind you and come out in front joe said well that's what happened to the russians he pointed there's the reservation we'll be cutting from the airplane in a moment now listen were you able to find out who either of general mccord's glider pilots are yeah freddy told him both are captains one is named bob flaubert and the other is jimmy haduka bob flaubert joe growled he's an artilleryman we've been in the drill together half a dozen times freddy was staring below trying to understand the terrain from his perspective while joe was tipping the lever which let the tow rope drop away from the glider the telly reporter said both of them used to fly light planes for sport when you started this new glider angle they must have seen the possibilities and took it up immediately but you ought to be able to fly circles around them they just haven't had the time for experience with planes without motors bob eh joe said softly he saved my life once five minutes later i saved his freddy looked up at him quickly zen he complained this is no time to be thinking of that so now you're even with him and you're both hired mercenaries in a fracas but i've got a gun and he hasn't joe growled good freddy snapped at him they had cut away from the light plane and joe headed for the area which cogswell had ordered him particularly to keep scanned jack altshuler was a fox in combat his heavy cavalry had more than once swung a fracas at the same time he kept himself alert for other gliders it seemed probable since the enemy forces had two that they would use them in relays which meant in turn that it was unlikely joe would find them both in the air at once in other words if he attacked the one possibly shooting it down then the other would be warned would mount a gun of its own and it would no longer be a matter of shooting a clay pigeon joe turned to mention this over his shoulder to freddy soligen just in time to catch the shadow above him and behind him holy sin he snapped kicking the right rudder thrusting his stick to the right and forward what the devil freddy protested looking up from adjusting the lens on his camera three or four thirty caliber slugs tore holes in their left wing the rest of the burst missed completely joe dove sharply gaining speed winged over and reached deliberately for altitude the other no the others were above him he yelled back at the cameraman put that chut chut gun together for me be ready to hand me pans of ammo and if you want blood and gore on that tele lens of yours get going it still hadn't got through to the smaller man what in the devil is going on joe banked again grabbing for a current rising along the hill slope circled circled reached for altitude before they could get over to him and make another pass he snapped bitterly did i say something about poor old bob flaubert not having a gun while i did well poor old bob's obviously got at least as much firepower as we have freddy i'm afraid matters have been pickled the other was startled 
Do I have to draw a picture? Joe said. Look! He pointed to where the other two aircraft circled, possibly a hundred meters above and five hundred to the right of them. The other two gliders bore a single passenger apiece, and were seemingly moving as quietly as Joe and Freddy, but gliders in motion are deceptive. Joe shot a glance at his rate of climb indicator. He was doing all right at six meters per second, a thousand feet a minute, considering his weight. Freddy had at last awakened to the fact that they were in combat, and even that the enemy had drawn first blood. The wound taken in their wing was not serious from Joe's viewpoint, but the torn holes in the fabric were obvious. But the little man had not gained his intrepid reputation as a telecameraman without cause. He moved fast, both to get the small French machine gun into Joe's hand and to get himself into action as a cameraman. He snapped, What's the situation? Joe, circling, circling, praying for an updraft that wouldn't give out on him before it did on the others, on their opposite hill, said, We weigh too much. Altitude counts. What have you got back there that can be thrown out? As he talked, he was shrugging himself out of his leather flying jacket. Nothing, Freddy said in anguish. I cut down my equipment to the barest, like you said. You've got extra lenses and stuff. Out with them. Joe tossed his coat over the glider's side, began unlacing his shoes. And all your clothes. Clothes are heavy. I need my equipment to get long-range shots, like when one of them crashes. The little man was scanning the others through his viewfinder, even as he argued and shrugged out of his own jacket. The updraft gave out, and the rate of climb meter began to register a drop. Joe swore and shot a glance at his opponents. Happily, they too had lost their currents. Both were now heading for him. Joe clipped out to his companion. We're not going to be getting shots of them crashing unless we lose more weight. Overboard with everything you can possibly afford, Freddy. That's an order. There was one thing in his favor. He had a year's flying experience, more than six months of it in this very glider. The stick and rudder bar were as though appendages of his body. One flies by the seat of one's pants in a soaring glider, and Joe flew his as though born to it. The others, obviously, were not as yet thoroughly used to engineless craft. He banked away from them, flying as judiciously as possible, begrudging every foot of drop. He could feel the craft jump lightly every time the cursing teller reporter jettisoned another article of equipment his pants or his shoes the others evidently had their guns fixed mounted to fire straight ahead joe wondered even as he slid away from them how they'd managed to escape detection from the sov world and newt world field observers well that could be worried about later one of them fired at him at too great a range and then both realizing that they were dropping altitude too quickly and that soon joe would be on their level turned away and sought a new updraft. As they banked, their faces were clearly discernible. One raised a hand in mock salute. Look at that curd-loving Bob, Joe laughed grudgingly. Here, let me have that gun. He steadied the small metralius on the edge of the cockpit, holding the craft's stick between his knees, and squeezed off a burst which rattled through the other's fuselage without apparent damage. The faux glider slid away quickly, losing precious altitude in the maneuver. Aha, Joe said wolfishly. So now they know we've got a stinger too. I got that, Freddy crowed. I got it perfectly. Listen, you're too high for the boys down below. Get lower so they can see you on lens, Joe. The other telly teams, every fracas buff in North America is watching this. Joe snorted his disgust. I hope every fracas buff in North America chokes on his trank pills, he snarled. We're in drill, Freddy. Understand? We're too heavy, and there's two of them and one of us. On top of that, those are Maxim guns they've got mounted, not pea shooters like this Chut Chut. That's your side of it, Freddy said, not unhappily. I got care of the photography. Get closer, Joe. Get closer. Joe had found another light updraft and gained a few hundred feet, 
but so had the others they circled circled his experience balanced their advantage of lesser weight happily their glide ratios didn't seem to be any better than his own had they high-performance gliders of 40 or even 35 gliding angle ratios he would have been lost nothing else you can toss out he growled at freddy what the zen freddy muttered nastily you want me to jump that's an idea joel growled wolfishly even as he circled circled i should have realized when you came to me with your fling about reintroducing aerial warfare that it wasn't an idea that others couldn't have it's just as easy for bob to mount a gun as it is for us now we're both kept from doing reconnaissance by the other and joe mauser broke it off in mid-sentence and his face blanched he shot a quick look downward all three gliders had climbed considerably and the terrain now was indistinct joe snapped hand me those glasses what glasses what's the matter freddy complained try to get closer to them and let me get a close-up of you giving them a burst my binoculars joe snapped urgently i want to see what's going on below oh freddy said i threw them out along with all the rest of the equipment glasses semaphore flags that sun blinker you had all of it went overboard with my extra lenses the craft was so banked as almost to have the wings perpendicular to earth joe shot an agonized look at the smaller man then back again to the earth below trying desperately to narrow his eyes for keener vision freddy said what in zen's the matter with you what difference does it make what they're doing down below we're all occupied up here thanks this is a frame-up joe growled bob and that other pilot they weren't out on reconnaissance this morning they were laying for me they're out to keep me from seeing what's going on down there and i know what's going on jack elshelter pulled a fast one here we go freddy hang on he slapped his flap brake lever with his left hand winged over and began dropping like a shot as his gliding angle fell off from twenty-five to one to ten to one in seconds the other two gliders were after him riding his tail freddy Soligen, his eyes bugging shot a look of fear at the two trailing aircraft both of which periodically showed brilliant cherries at their prows maxim guns emitting their blessings the tele reporter turned desperately back to joe mauser pounding him on the shoulder his physical fear was secondary to another joe you're on the lens of every tele team down there and you're running cut that out joe rapped duck your head let me train this gun over you i've got to keep these jokers from shooting off our tail before i can get to the marshal the marshal freddy yelled you can't get to him anyway i told you i threw away your semaphore flags your blinker everything this country's hilly you can't get your message to him anyway listen joe you still got time you can stunt these things better than those two can duck joe snarled he let loose a burst at the pursuing glider over the smaller man's head and just missed his own tail section they sped down almost to tree level at fantastic speed for a glider the two enemy craft were hot after them their guns flack flack flacking in continuous excitement trying to catch joe in sights as he kicked rudder right left right in evasive maneuvers his guess had been correct the swashbuckling jack altschuler had known his many times commander even better than cogswell had realized instead of three alternative maneuvers open to the wily cavalryman he'd ferreted out a fourth and his full force hauling mountain guns on mule back with them were trailing over the supposedly impossible mountain path which originally could not have been more than a deer track freddy soligen in back was holding his head in his hands in surrender he could have focused on the troops below but the desire wasn't in him not one fracas buff in a hundred could comprehend the complications of combat the need for adequate reconnaissance the need for joe to get through he made one last plea joe we put everything into this every share of stock you've accumulated 
All I have, too. Don't you realize what you're doing, so far as the buffs are concerned? Those two half-trained pilots behind have you on the run. Joe growled. And twenty thousand lads down below are depending on me to report on Allschulter's horse. But you can't win anyway. You can't get your message to Cogswell. Joe shot him a wolfish grin. Wanna bet? Ever heard of a crash landing, Freddy? Hang on. The end of chapter ten of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Recording by Dale Grothman. Chapter 11 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Stretched out on the convalescent bed in the category military rest home, Joe grinned up at his visitor and said ruefully, I'd salute you, sir, but my arm seemed to be out of commission. And, come to think of it, I'm out of uniform. Cogswell looked down at him, unamused. You've heard the news? Joe caught the other's tone, and his face straightened. You mean the Disarmament Commission? Cogswell said brittily, They found against the use of aircraft, other than free balloons, in any military action. They threw the book, Mauser. The court ruled that you, Robert Flaubert, and James Hidaka, be stripped of rank and forbidden the category military. You have also been fined all stock shares in your possession other than those inalienably yours as a West World citizen. Joe's face went empty. It was only then that he realized that the other was attired in the uniform of a brigadier general. The direction of his eyes was obvious. Cogswell shrugged bitterly my upper caste status helped me i could pull just enough strings that the category military department in conjunction with the rulings of the international disarmament commission merely reduced me in rank and belted me with a stiff fine your friend your former friend i should say freddy soligen testified in my behalf testified that i had no knowledge of your mounting a gun the former marshal cleared his throat. His testimony was correct. I had no such knowledge, and would have issued orders against it, had I known. The fact that you enabled me to rescue the situation into which I'd been sucked helped somewhat my feelings towards you, Mauser, but only somewhat. Joe could imagine the other's bitterness. He had fought his way up the hard way to that marshal's baton, at his age, he wasn't going to regain it. Brigadier General Stonewall Cogswell hesitated for a moment, then said, One other thing. United Miners has repudiated your actions, even to the point of refusing the cost of your hospitalization. I told the Category Medicine authorities to put your bill on my account. Joe said quite stiffly, that won't be necessary sir i'm afraid you'll find it is mauser the former marshal allowed himself a grimace besides i owe you something for that spectacular scene when you came skimming over the treetops the two enemy gliders right behind you then stalling your craft and crashing into that tree not thirty feet from my open-air headquarters admittedly in forty years of fracases, I've never seen anything so confoundedly dramatic. Thank you, sir. The old soldier grunted, turned, and marched from the room. End of chapter 11 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds Recording by Dale Grothman Chapter 12 of Frigid Fracas by Mark Reynolds. Freddy Soligen had been miraculously saved from the physical beating taken by Joe Mauser in the crash. The pilot, sitting so close before him, cushioned with his own body that of the tele reporter. For that matter, he had been saved the financial disaster as well, 
save for the amount he had contributed to the campaign to increase Mauser's status in the eyes of the buffs. His category communications superiors had not even charged him for the cost of the equipment he had jettisoned from the glider during the flight, nor that which had been destroyed in the crash. If anything, his reputation with his higher-ups was probably better than ever. He had been in there pitching, as a telereporter, right up until the end when the situation had completely pickled. All he had lost was his dream. It had been so close to the grasping. He could almost have tasted the sweetness of victory. Joe Mauser, at the ultimate top of the hero heap. Joe Mauser accepting bonuses in both rank and caste. And then Joe Mauser being properly thankful and helpful to Freddy and Sam Soligen in their turn. So near the realization of the dream. He entered his house wearily, finally free of all the ridiculous questioning of the commission and the courts martial of Mauser and Cogswell and Flaubert, Hidaka, and their commander, General McCord. All had been found guilty, though in different degrees. Using weapons of warfare which post dated 1900, than which there was no greater crime between nations. He tossed the briefcase he had carried to the table and made his way to the living room heading for the auto bar and straight spirits a voice said hi papa he looked up not immediately recognizing the category military rank private before him then he said weakly sam his legs gave way and he sat down abruptly on the couch which faced the wall which was the telly screen the boy said awkwardly surprise papa his father said very slowly what in zen are you doing in that outfit sam grinned ruefully albeit proud ah oh, it would have taken a century for me to make full priest papa the only way to do is like major mauser you didn't know this but i've been following the fracases all along especially when you were the reporter i've watched every fracas you've covered for years i guess you know i'm pretty proud of you sam what are you doing in that uniform answer me the boy flushed i'm old enough papa i switch categories i've signed up with chrysler ford and their fracas with hover car sports they're taking me on as an infantryman infantryman freddy winced and closed his eyes listen boy where'd you get the idea that he started over again but all your life i've given you the inside on the category military sam all your life no trank in our home no watching the telly day in and out you've gone to school more than i ever did you're going to be a temple priest sam sat down too vaguely surprised at this father's reaction ah papa everybody's a fracas buff now everybody you can't get away from it i well I want to be like Major Mauser. Get so all the fans know me, want my autograph, all that. And all the excitement of being in a fracas, getting in the drill and all. I just want to be like the other fellows, Papa. Freddy could only stare at him. Sam tried to explain. Shucks, it was really you that made me want to become a mercenary. You're the best telereporter of them all. When you cover a fracas, Papa, you really do it you can see everything he shook his head in admiration gosh you really feel the emotion it's the most exciting thing in the world yeah son freddy soligen said emptily i suppose it is the end of chapter twelve of frigid fracas by mac reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by dale Grothman. Chapter 13 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Joe was able to get around on auto crutches by the time she finally arrived, a stereotype visitor, done up brightly, a box of candy in one hand, flowers in the other. He could see her coming across the lawn from the visitors' offices. He wished that he had worn his other suit. His clothing was on the skimpy side when uniforms were subtracted. She came up to him well joe he looked at the flowers and attempted a grin 
Lily's would have been more appropriate, considering the shape I'm in. Nadine said, I've just been talking to the staff doctors. You're not in as bad a shape as all that. Some bones mending is all. The grin turned wry. I wasn't just thinking of physical shape. He settled on the stone bench, which stood on one side of the walk he had been exercising upon when she arrived. For a moment, she remained standing. He looked up at her. Well, he said, I didn't break your condition, he said. Am I still receivable? She frowned. Joe said bitterly, you told me that you were going to take the fracas in, and if my actions resulted in any casualties, you never wanted to see me again. She took the place next to him. I did watch. For a time, the rest of the battle going on below was ignored, and you were full on lenses for at least twenty minutes. I've never been so frightened in my life. Joe said, the first step towards becoming a buff. First, you're scared, vicariously. But it's fun to become scared when nothing can really happen to you. It becomes increasingly exciting to see others threatened with death and then actually die before you. After a while, you're hooked. She looked carefully at the flowers. That's not exactly what I meant. I was frightened for you, Joe, not thrilled. He looked at her for a long moment. Finally, he breathed deeply and said, Well, you'll never have to go through that again. I'm no longer in category military, I suppose you know. It was on the news, Joe, she laughed without amusement. In fact, I knew even before. Balt was tried too. Balt? Your brother? She nodded. You first used your glider in that fracas for father and vacuum tube transport. Now that the Commission has ruled against gliders, Balt, now head of the family, has been both fined and expelled from Category Military for life. It hasn't exactly improved his liking for you. Joe hadn't heard of it. However, he had little sympathy for Balt Hare, nor interest in him. He said, Why did you take so long to come? I was thinking, Joe. And then you finally came? Yes. He looked away into the unseen distance. Finally, he cleared his throat and said, Nadine, the first time I ever talked to you, to any extent, I mentioned that I wanted to achieve the top in this status of our world. I mentioned that I hadn't built this world, and possibly didn't even approve of it. But since I'm in it, and have no other recourse, I must follow its rules. She nodded. I remember. And I said, why not try and change the rules? Joe nodded. He moistened his lips carefully. Okay, now I'm willing to listen. How do we go about changing the rules? The end of chapter 13 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Recording by Dale Grothman. Chapter 14 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds Dr. Nadine Haar, Category Medicine, Mid-Upper Caste, was driving, and with considerable enjoyment, resultant not only from her destination, long desired, now to be realized, but also from the sheer exuberance of handling the vehicle. Since prehistory, man's pleasure in the physical control of a speedy vehicle has been superlative, particularly when that vehicle is known by the driver to be unique in its class. The Hittite charioteer, bowling across the landscape of Anatolia. A sterling moss carefully tooling his automobile around the multiple curves of the upper cornice on the Riviera. Or Nadine Har, delicately trimming the controls of the sports model hovercar. She shot a quick glance at Joe Mauser, formerly of Category Military formerly rank major, now an unemployed middle-middle, who slouched in the bucket seat next to her. He noticed neither speed nor direction. Nadine called above the wind. Zen, Joe, where did you ever acquire such a car? It must have been built entirely by hand, 
and by Swiss watchmakers. Joe stirred and shrugged. Newly from the hospital, he was still deep in the gloom of his recent loss of the dream, the defeat of his lifelong ambitions. He said, A buff gave it to me. She slowed down, the better to frown at him in amazement. Gave it to you? Why, the thing is priceless! Joe sighed and told her the salient details. Quite a few mercenaries managed to acquire a private fracas buff. He defined the terms for her. He makes a hobby of your career, winds up knowing more about it than you yourself can possibly remember. He follows every fracas you get into, knows every time you cop one, how serious it was, and how long you were in hospital. He glories every time you get a promotion, is in gloom every time your side loses a fracas. He's got a picture of you in various poses, taken from the fracas buff magazines, and files away all the articles in which your name appears. Zen, Nadine laughed in deprecation. That's just the beginning. After a while, he starts writing you fan letters, wanting autographed portraits, wanting a souvenir, sometimes nothing more exciting than a button off your uniform. More often, they want a gun, sword, or combat knife, particularly one they saw you use in some fracas or other. They usually offer to pay for such, sometimes quite fabulous amounts. Other times, they want a bit of bloody uniform, your own true blood, from the time when you were in the drill and managed to cop one. Nadine was astonished. Antagonistic as she was herself to the fracases, she wasn't particularly knowledgeable about all their ramifications. She said, repelled, But doesn't such morbidity disgust you? This fawning, this slobbering. Joe grunted, All part of the game. A mercenary without buffs to boost him, to form fracas buff clubs and such, hasn't much chance of promotion. So far as disgust is concerned, you'd have to see one of the really far-out ones. The gleam in an ordinary fish-like eye when he recounts the time you killed three men in hand-to-hand -hand combat, equipped only with an entrenching tool, when they came at you with bayonets. The trace of spittle running down from the side of his mouth. And this buff of yours, why did he give you this perfectly marvelous car? It was a she, not a he, Joe said. Nadine's voice changed infinitesimally. You mean you accepted a gift of this value from a woman? He looked at her and grinned sourly. I wasn't in much of a position to refuse. The gift was in her will. She was well into her nineties when she died. She was an upper-upper, by the way, and the most knowledgeable fracas buff I ever met. She knew the intimate details of every fracas since Tilgath Peisler and his Assyrians captured Babylon. She could argue for an hour over whether Parmenion or Alexander the Great should have been given the credit for the victory over the Persians at Isis. Joe grunted. I suppose there should be a moral somewhere about this kindly old lady who was the outstanding fracas buff of them all. Nadine Har was in the process of hitting the drop lever with her left hand as they slowed and headed for the entrance of the parking area. She said brittily, The moral is that you can have slobs in any level of society. Being an upper doesn't guarantee anything. Joe sighed. Here we go again. He looked around him, scowling. Which brings to mind, Where are we going? These are government buildings, aren't they? They were sinking quickly below the street level, now in the power of the auto parker. Nadine turned off the engine and released the controls. She said, cryptogrammically, We are going to see about doing something with your abilities, other than shooting at people or being shot at. When the car was parked, she led the way to an elevator. Joe said wryly, Oh, great! I love mysteries. When do we find out who killed the victim? Nadine looked at him from the side of her eyes. I killed the victim, she said. Major Mauser, mercenary by trade, is now no more. There was bitterness in him, 
and he found no ability to respond to what was meant as humor in her words he followed her silently and his puzzlement grew with him the office building through which they moved was as well done as any he could remember having observed even on the telly surely they couldn't be in the octagon or the new white house but if so why nadine said here we are and indicated a door which opened at their approach there was a receptionist in the small office beyond a bit of ostentation joe mauser seldom met with in the modern world what in the name of zen could anyone need with other than an auto receptionist didn't efficiency mean anything here the receptionist said good afternoon dr hare mr holland is expecting you it came to joe now philip holland secretary to harlow manheimer the minister of foreign affairs he had met the man a few months ago at nadine's house in a swank section of greater washington once known as baltimore but he had no idea what nadine had in mind bringing him here evidently she was well enough into the graces of the bureaucracy to barge into his office during working hours surprising in itself since although she was an upper born still governmental servants can't be at the back of every hereditary aristocrat in the land holland stood up briefly at their entrance and shook hands quickly almost abruptly held a chair for nadine motioned to another one for joe he sat down again and said into the interoffice telemic miss mckayle the dossier on joseph mauser and would you request frank hodgson to drop in what was obviously the dossier slid from the desk chute and holland leafed through it as though disinterested he said joseph mauser born mid lower clothing category subdivision shoes branch repair holland looked up a somewhat plebeian beginning let us admit a tick manifested itself at the side of joe mauser's mouth but he said nothing if long years in the military had taught him anything it was patience the other man had the initiative now let him use it holland cast his eyes ceilingward and without referring to the dossier before him said cross categories at the age of seventeen to military remained a rank private for three years at which time promoted to corporal sergeant followed in another three years and upon reaching the rank of lieutenant at the age of twenty-five was bounced in caste to high lower after distinguishing himself in a fracas between douglas boeing and lockheed cessna was further raised to low middle caste by the age of thirty had reached mid middle caste and rank captain by thirty-three the present had been promoted to major and had been under consideration for upper middle caste that last joe had not known about however he said now also at present expelled from participating in future fracases on any level of rank and find his complete resources beyond the basic common stock issued him as a mid-middle his voice was bitter phil holland said briskly the risk run by the ambitious the office door opened and a tall stranger entered he had a strange gait one shoulder held considerably lower than the other to the point that joe would have thought it the result of a wound hadn't the other obviously never been a soldier the newcomer office pallor heavily upon him but his air of languor obviously assumed and artificial darted his eyes around the room to holland nadine and then to joe where they rested for a moment he murmured some banality to nadine indicative of long acquaintance and then approached joe who had automatically come to his feet and extended a hand to be shaken i'm frank hodson you're joe mauser i'm not fracas buff but i know enough about current developments to know that welcome aboard joe joe shook the hand offered in some surprise welcome aboard he said hodgson looked at phil holland his eyebrows raised in question holland said crisply you're premature frank 
Dr. Hare and Mauser have just arrived. Oh, the newcomer found himself a chair, crossed his legs, and fumbled in his pocket for a pipe, leaving it to the others to resume the conversation he had interrupted. Philip Holland said to Joe, Frank is the assistant to Wallace Pepper. He looked at Hodgson and frowned. I don't believe you have any other title, do you, Frank? I don't think so, Frank yawned. Can't think of any. Joe Mauser looked from one to the other, confusion adding to confusion within him. Wallace Pepper was the longtime head of the North American Bureau of Investigation, having held that position under the last four administrations. Nadine said dryly, Which goes to show you, Joe, just how much titles mean. Commissioner Pepper has been all but senile over the past five years. Frank here is the true head of the Bureau. Frank Hodgson said mildly, Why, Nadine, that's a rather strong statement. Joe blurted, Head of the Bureau of Investigation? I had gathered the impression I was being taken to meet some members of an underground, organized for the purpose of, as it was put, changing the present rules of government. Frank Hodgson grinned at Nadine and laughed softly. That's a gentle way of describing revolution. Holland looked at Joe Mauser and said quickly, I'll try to take you off the hook as quickly as possible, Joe. Tell me, when you hear the word revolution, what comes first to your mind? Joe, flustered, said, Why, I don't know, fighting, riots, people running around in the streets with banners, that sort of thing. Hmm, Holland nodded, the common conception. However, a social revolution isn't, by definition, necessarily bloody. Picture a gigantic wheel, Joe. We call it the wheel of history. From time to time it makes a turn, forward, we hope, but sometimes backward. Such a turn is a revolution. Whether or not there is anybody under the wheel at the time of its turning is beside the point. The revolution takes place whether or not there's bloodshed. He thought a moment. Or you might compare it to childbirth. The fact that there is pain in childbirth, or, if through modern medical science the pain is eliminated, is beside the point. Childbirth consists of a new baby coming into the world. The mother might even die, but childbirth has taken place. She might feel no pain whatsoever under anesthetic, but childbirth has taken place. Joe said carefully, I'm no authority, but it seems to me that usually, if changes take place in a socio-economic system without bloodshed, we call it evolution. Revolution is when they take place with conflict. Holland shook his head. No, poor definitions. Among other things, don't confuse revolt, civil wars, and such with revolution. They aren't the same thing. You can have civil war, military revolts, and various civil disturbances without having a socio-economic revolution. Let's use this for an example. Take a fertilized egg. Inside of it, a chick is slowly developing, slowly evolving. But it is still an egg. The chick finally grows tiny wings, a beak, even little feathers. Fine, but so far, it's just evolution within the shell of the egg. But one day, that chick cannot develop further without breaking the shell and freeing itself of what was once its factor of defense but now threatens its very life. The shell must go. When that culminating action takes place, you have a revolutionary change, and we are no longer dealing with an egg, but a chicken. Joe, one by one, looked at the three of them. He said finally to Nadine, rather than the men, What's this got to do with me? She leaned forward in her earnestness. All your life you've been revolting against the status quo, Joe. You've beaten your head against the situation that confronted you, against a society you felt didn't allow you to develop your potentialities. But now you admit that you've been wrong. What is needed is to... 
she shot a defiant glance at frank hodson to his amusement change the rules if the race is to get back onto the road to progress she shrugged very well you can't expect it to be done single-handed you need an organization others who feel the same way you do here we are he was truly amazed now when he had finally admitted interest in what nadine had hinted to be a subversive organization he had in mind some secretive group possibly making their headquarters in a hidden cellar complete with primitive printing press and possibly some weapons he most certainly hadn't expected to be introduced to the secretary of the foreign minister and the working head of the north american bureau of investigation joe blurted but but you mean your uppers are actually planning to subvert your own government holland said i'm not an upper i'm a mid-middle where are you frank darned if i know hodgson said i forget i think i was bounced up to upper middle about ten years ago for some reason or other but i was busy at the time and didn't pay much attention every once in a while one of the uppers i work with gets all excited about it and wants to jump me to upper but somehow or other we've never gotten around to it what difference does it make joe mauser was not the type to let his mouth fall agape but he stared at the other unbelievingly what's the matter hodgson said nothing joe said phil holland said briskly let's get on with it nadine his voice had a dry quality is one of our most efficient talent scouts it was no mistake i met you at her home a few weeks back joe she thought you were potentially one of us i admit to having formed the same opinion upon our brief meeting i now put the question to you directly do you wish to join our organization the purpose of which is admittedly to change our present socio-economic system as nadine put it get back on the road to progress yes joe said i do very well welcome aboard as frank said your first assignment will take you to budapest they were throwing these curves too fast for joe noted among his senior officers as a quick man thinking on his feet he still wasn't up to this sort of thing budapest he ejaculated the capital of the Sov world but but why phil holland looked at him patiently there are many ramifications to revolution joe particularly in this present day with its frigid fracas which has gone on for generations between the west world and the Sov world and the new world standing at the sidelines glaring at us both you see really efficient revolutions may not look like revolutions at all just unusual results of historic accidents and if we're going to make this one peaceful we've got to take every measure to assure efficiency one of those measures involves a thorough knowledge of where the Sov world stands and what it might do if there were any signs of change in the status quo here in the west world frank hodgson said idly i believe you have met colonel lajos arped joe said puzzled still again why yes one of those military attaches an observer of our fracases to see whether or not the universal disarmament pact is violated but also colonel arpad is probably the most competent espionage agent working out of budapest that corseted giggling nincompoop frank hodgson laughed softly if even an old pro like yourself hadn't spotted him then we have one more indication of arpad's abilities phil holland took up the ball again the presence of colonel arpad in greater washington is no coincidence he is here for something we're not sure what however rumors have been coming out of the so world and particularly siberia and the more backward countries to the south such as Sinkiang, rumors of an underground organized to overthrow the Soves. And that religious thing, Nadine added. Frank Hodgson murmured, Yes, indeed. We received two more reports of it today. 
all looked at him he said to joe some fanatic in siberia a truvanian one of the turkic speaking peoples in the area once called tuvan tuva and now the tuvanian autonomous oblast he's attracted quite a following destroys the machines go back to the old ways till the soil by hand let the women spin and weave and make clothing on the hand loom once more ride horses rather than hovercraft and jets that sort of thing and oh yes kill those who stand in the way of this holy mission you mean this is catching hold in this day and age joe said like wildfire hodgins said easily and i wouldn't be too very surprised if it would do the same over here pressures are generating in this world of ours we'll either make changes peaceably or zen knows what will happen the soves haven't been exposed to religion for several generations joe probably the party heads had forgotten it as a potential danger here in the west world we do better the temple provides us a pressure valve in that particular area but i still wouldn't like to see our trank and telly bemused morons subjected to a sudden blast of revival type religion joe looked back at holland i still don't get my going to budapest how why when holland glanced at the desk watch and became brisk i have an appointment with the president he said we'll have to turn this over to some of the other members of this group they'll explain the details joe nadine's going too in her case as a medical attache in our embassy in budapest you'll go as a military observer check on potential violations of the universal disarmament pact a sudden thought struck him i imagine it would add to your prestige and possibly open additional doors to you if you carried more status he looked again at the telly mic on his desk miss mikhail in my office there is joseph mauser now middle middle in cast please take the necessary steps to raise him to low upper immediately i'll clear this with tom and he'll authorize it as recommended through the white house is that clear in a daze joe could hear the receptionist's voice yes sir joseph mauser to be raised to low upper caste immediately the end of chapter fourteen of frigid fracas by mac reynolds recording by dale grothman chapter fifteen of frigid fracas by mac reynolds budapest basically had changed little over half a millennium the danube seldom blue except when seen through the eyes of a twosome between whom spark had recently been struck still wandered its way dividing the old old town of pest from the still older town of buddha where the stream widens there is room for the one hundred and twelve acres of margitsugat or margaret island to the west world down through the ages through celts and romans slavs and hungs turks and magyars none have been so gross as to use margitsugat for other than a park buddha lying to the west of the danube is of rolling hills and bluffs of ancient towers fortresses castles and walls which have suffered through a hundred wars a score of revolutions it dominates the younger more dynamic pest which stretches out on the flat plains to the east so that though you stand on the hamish hartity hill of buddha and strain your eyes you are hard put to find the furthest limits of pest the jet port was on the outskirts of pest the craft carrying nadine har joseph mauser and max mance settled in for a gentle landing the autopilot more delicate far than the human eye served by the human hand max his eyes glued to the window said well gee it doesn't look much different than a lot of other towns we passed over nadine looked at him and laughed she alone of the three of them had ever been outside the boundaries of the west world having attended several international medical conventions over the years 
the frigid fracas had laid its chill on tourism so that now travel between westworld and soveworld was all but unknown and even visiting the newt world was considered a bit far out and somewhat suspect of going beyond the old-time way of doing things even among the uppers securing a passport for a middle's trip not to speak of a lowers involved such endless bureaucratic red tape as to be nonsensical nadine said to joe's batman what did you expect max well i didn't know miss her i mean dr hare kind of gloomier like shocks i've seen this here town on telly a dozen times and seeing is believing joe muttered cynically it looks as though we have a reception committee he looked at nadine are we supposed to know each other she shrugged and made a move it would be somewhat strange if we didn't seeing that we flew over in the same aircraft and were the only passengers to come this far he nodded and as the plane came to a halt helped her from her chair even as the plane's ladder slipped out and touched the ground joe grunted and said as though to himself you realize that for all practical purposes there hasn't been any improvement in aircraft for a generation nadine looked at him from the side of her eyes even as they descended that's what i keep telling you joe we've become ossified when a society afraid of change adopts a policy of maintaining the status quo at any cost progress is arrested progress means change he grinned at her sure 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 please no more lectures teacher let what's already in my head stew a while on the ground nadine was met by one contingent from the embassy and from the sov world authorities and joe and max by another joe became occupied hardly more than noticing that she had been whisked away by a hover limo ornately bedecked with official flags and stars joe no longer holding military rank in spite of his mission was in mufti and restrained himself from returning the salute when greeted by two fresh young lieutenants from the embassy and a bemetalled lieutenant colonel in sov world uniform whose tight-waisted tunic reminded joe of that worn by colonel lahos arpad the military attache joe had come across twice in the west world fracases and who frank hodgson had branded an espionage agent joe swore again inwardly that these hungarian officers must wear girdles under their uniforms and wondered vaguely if they did so in combat the lieutenants who could have been twins so alike were they in size bright smiling faces uniform and words of welcome saluted joe shook hands and then turned to introduce him to the sov world officer one of them said major mauser may we present to you lieutenant bella koseth of the pink army they were evidently using joe's old title of rank as if he were retired rather than dismissed from the category military it meant little to joe mauser the sov officer clicked his heels bowed from the waist extended his hand to be shaken his waist might be pinched in like that of a girl of the nineteenth century but his hand was dry and firm the fame of joseph mauser has penetrated to the proletarian paradise he said his voice conveying sincerity joe shook and said pink army i thought you called it the colonel was indicating a hover limousine with a sweeping gesture that would have seemed overly graceful had not joe felt the grip of the man only a moment earlier kosef interrupted him politely the plane was a trifle late and the banquet we have prepared awaits us major a multitude of my fellow officers are anxious to meet the famed joe mauser would it surprise you to know i have replayed a score of times your celebrated holding action on the louisiana military reservation such unbelievable with but a single company of men joe looked at him blankly celebrated joe couldn't but remember the fracas the mincing hungarian was talking about when the front had collapsed joe then a captain had held his position in the swamps while his superiors were supposedly reforming behind him actually while they were frantically trying to reach terms with the enemy 
one of the westworld lieutenants laughed at joe's expression you're going to have to get used to the fact that there are as many fracas buffs over here sir as there are back home the sove colonel wagged a finger at him but no you misunderstand completely lieutenant anderson we study the bloody fracases of the west following the campaigns of such tacticians as your marshal stonewall cogswell goes far toward the training of our own pink army in its um fracases that brought up a dozen questions in joe's mind but first he turned and indicated max who had been standing behind his eyes wide and taking in the luxurious airport the vehicles about it the buildings the airport workers few in number though they be the road leading to the city beyond joe said gentlemen may i present max mans the faces of the lieutenants went blank one of them coughed as though apologetically the sove colonel looked from joe to max and then back again his face assumed that expression so well known to joe for so very long the aristocrat looking at one of the lower classes as though wondering what made the fellow tick kosif said but surely this uh chap is a servant one of your what do you call them uh lower max blinked unhappily and looked at joe joe mauser said evenly i had heard that the soul world was a utopia of the proletariat however gentlemen max mance is my friend as well as my assistant the three officers murmured some things stiffly to max who a lower born was not overly nonplussed by the situation zen he knew the three were upper caste what was major mauser getting into a tizzy about he was given the seat in front where the chauffeur would have been and the others took places in the rear one of the lieutenants dialing the hover car's destination joe mauser said i am afraid my background is hazy colonel kosith you mentioned the pink army you also mentioned your own fracases i knew you maintained an army of course but i thought the fracas was a west development in fact your military attaches are usually on the scornful side the two lieutenants grinned but kosith said seriously major as always nations which hold each other at arm's length use different terminology to say much the same thing it need not be confusing if one digs below to find reality perhaps for a moment we four can lower barriers enough for me to explain that whilst in the west world you hold your fracases to he began enumerating on his fingers one settle disputes between business competitors or between corporations and unions two to train soldiers for your defense requirements three to keep bemused a potential dangerous lower class i object to that colonel one of the lieutenants said hotly the sove officer ignored him four to dispose of the more aggressive potential rebels by allowing them to kill each other off in the continual combat that sir is simply not true the lieutenant blurted joe couldn't remember if he was anderson or dixon even their names were similar joe said evenly and your alternative the hungarian shrugged the proletarian paradise maintains two armies major one of veterans for defense against potential foreign foes and named the glorious invincible red army or the red army for short one of the lieutenants murmured dryly and the other composed of less experienced proletarians and their techno intellectual and sometimes even party officers this is our pink army wait a moment joe said what's a proletarian the lieutenant who had protested the sove officer's summation of the reasons for the west world fracases laughed dryly kosith stared at joe you are poorly founded in the background of the so world major joe said deliberately colonel kosith when i learned of my assignment i deliberately avoided cramming unsifted information i decided it would be more desirable to get my information at the source uncontaminated by our own west world propaganda one of the stiff-necked twins both of whom joe was beginning to find a bit too stereotyped westworld adherents said sir 
I must protest. The West does not utilize propaganda. Of course not, Kosuth said, taking his turn at a dry tone. He said to Joe, I admire your decision. Obviously a correct one. Major, a proletarian is, well, you could say, um, a lower lower, Anderson, or Dixon said. Not exactly, the so protested. Let us put it this way. Marx once wrote that when true socialism had arrived, the formula would be from each according to his abilities and to each according to his needs. Unhappily, due to the fact that the proletarian paradise is surrounded by potential enemies, we have not as yet established this formula. Instead, it is now from each according to his abilities and to each according to his contribution. Consequently, the most useful members of our society are drawn into the ranks of the party and, contributing the most, are most highly rewarded. The party consists of somewhat less than one percent of the population. And is for all practical purposes hereditary, Anderson or Dixon said. Kosuth, in indignation, parroted unknowingly the lieutenant's earlier words. That, sir, is simply not true. Joe said, soothing over the ruffled waters, and the, what did you call them, techno-intellectuals? They are the second most useful members of society, are technicians, scientists, although many of these are members of the party, of course, teachers, artists, pink and red army officers, and so forth. Max looked around from the front seat. Well, gee, that sounds just about like uppers, middles, and lowers to me. Joe Mauser cleared his throat and said to the Hungarian, who was glaring at Max, And the pink army? But Kosuth bit out to Max. Don't be silly, my man. There are no classes in the proletarian paradise. Yeah, Max said, and back in the West World we've got people's capitalism, and people own the corporations. Yeah. That'll be all, Max, Joe said, getting in before the two lieutenants could snap something to the feisty little man. Joe had already decided that the lieutenants were both uppers, and was somewhat surprised at their lowly rank. Kosuth brought his attention back to Joe. We're almost to our destination, Major Mauser. However, briefly, some of the more recent additions to the so world, particularly in the more backward areas of southern Asia, have not quite adjusted to the glories of the proletarian paradise. Both the lieutenants chuckled softly. Kosuth said, So it is found necessary to dispatch punitive expeditions against them. A current such expedition is in the Kunlun Mountains, in an area once known as Sinkiang to the north, Tibet to the south. Kyrgyz and Kazitz nomads in the region persist in rejecting the party and its program. The Pink Army is in the process of eliminating these reactionary elements. Joe was puzzled. He said, You mean in all these years you haven't been able to clean up such a small element of enemies? Kozith said stiffly, My dear Major, please recall that we are limited to the use of weapons pre-1900 in accord with the Universal Disarmament Pact. To be blunt, it is quite evident that foreign elements smuggle weapons into Tibet and other points where rebellion flares, so that on some occasions our pink army is confronted with enemies better armed than themselves. These bandits, of course, are not under the jurisdiction of the International Commission, and while we are limited, they are not. Perhaps, one of the lieutenants said, they don't want to clean them up. If they did, the Sov equivalent of the fracas buff wouldn't be able to spend his time at the telly, watching the progress of the glorious pink army against the reactionary foe. Joe, under his breath, parroted the words of the Sov officer. That, sir, is simply not true. Max, who had been largely staring bug-eyed out the window at the passing scene, said, Hey, the car's stopping. Is this it? The end of chapter 15 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds.
Read by Dale Grothman. Chapter 16 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Although in actuality working on a private mission for Philip Holland, Frank Hodgson, and the others high in government responsibility who were planning fundamental changes in the West world, Joseph Mauser was ostensibly a military attache connected with the West world embassy in Budapest. As such, he spent several days meeting embassy personnel, his immediate superiors, and his immediate inferiors in rank. He was, as a newcomer from home, wined, dined, evaluated, found an apartment, assigned a hover car, and in general assimilated into the community. Not ordinarily prone to the social life, Joe was able to find interest in this due to its newness. The citizen of the West World, when exiled by duty to a foreign land, evidently did his utmost to take his native soil with him. Even house furnishings had been brought from North America. So food and drink were superlative, particularly for those of party rank. But for all practical purposes, all such supplies were flown in from the West. Hungarian potables, not to mention the products of a dozen other so political divisions, including Russia, were of the best. But the denizens of the West World Embassy drank bourbon and scotch, or at most, the products of the vines of California. The styles of Budapest rivaled those of Paris and Rome, New York and Hollywood, but a feminine employee of the embassy wouldn't have been caught dead in local fashions. It was a home away from home, an oasis of the West in the Sov world. Joe, figuring that in the view of the double role unknown even to the higher-ranking officers of the embassy, he would best secure protective coloring by conforming and would have slipped into the embassy routine without more than ordinary notice but that wasn't nadine's style from the first she gloried in purkelt the veal stew with paprika sauce in rostelos the round steak potted in still hotter paprika sauce in halasli the french soup which is hungary's challenge to french bouillabaisse and threatened her lithe figure with her consumption of retas the Magyar strudel. All of these washed down with Semerodny, or a Hungarian Riesling, the despair of a hundred generations of connoisseurs due to its inability to travel. When liqueurs were called for, Barak, a highly distilled apricot brandy, which was still the national tipple, was her choice, if not Toke Azu, a sweet nectar wine, once allowed only to be consumed by nobility, so precious was it considered. Her apartment became adorned with Hungarian, Bulgarian, and Czech antiques, somewhat to the surprise even to the few Sovs with whom she and Joe associated. It had been long years since antiques were in vogue. She dressed in the latest styles from the dressing centers of Prague, Leningrad, or even from local houses, ignoring the raised eyebrows of her embassy associates. Joe, with an inner sigh, followed along in the swath she cut nadine being nadine and the woman he loved to boot he being raised to cast upper through the easy efforts of philip holland had made no observable difference in his relationship with nadine of course she was a mid upper he told himself while he was a low upper still it was far from unknown for romances to cross such comparatively little boundary he couldn't quite figure out why she seemed to hold him at arm's length Months had passed since she had told him, that day, she would marry him, even though he was a middle. But now, when he tried to get her off by herself, for a moment of intimacy between them, she avoided the situation. When he brought their personal relationship into conversation, she switched subjects. Joe, wedded for a long time to his grim profession, inexperienced in the world of a lover, was out of his element. His upper caste rating also made little impression on the other embassy personnel, largely because it was the prevailing rank. In dealing with the Soves, they came into contact almost exclusively with party members, and policy was that West World officials never be put in a position to have to work with Soves who ranked them. 
only routine office workers were drawn from the middle caste and largely they kept to themselves except during working hours joe's immediate superior turned out to be general george armstrong with whom joe had once served some years earlier when the general had commanded a fracas between two labor unions fighting out a jurisdictional squabble although joe hadn't particularly distinguished himself in that fray the general remembered him well enough joe recognized as the old pro he was was taken in with open arms somewhat to the surprise of older embassy military attaches who ranked him in caste or seniority at the first getting organized in apartment and office getting his feeling of budapest its transportation systems its geographical layout its offerings in entertainment he had come little in contact with either the hungarians or the other officials of the Soviet world who teamed the city in a way it was confusion upon confusion since budapest is the center of sovism and the languages of indochina outer mongolia latvia bulgaria karelia or albania were as apt to be heard on the street or in restaurant as was hungarian but joe mauser was in no hurry his instructions were to take the long view to take his time to feel his way somewhere along the line a door would open and he would find that for which he sought in a way max mance seemed to acclimate himself faster than either nadine or joe the little man completely without language other than anglo-american the lingua franca of the west whilst joe had both french and spanish and nadine french and german was still of such persistent social aggressiveness that in a week's time he knew every hungarian of the proletarian rank within a wide neighborhood of where they lived or worked within a month he had managed to acquire present tense almost verbless jargon with which he was able to conduct all necessary transactions pertaining to his household duties and to get into surprisingly complicated arguments as well joe had to give up attempting to persuade him that discretion was called for in discussing the relative merits of westworld and soveworld in fact it was through max that joe mauser made his breakthrough in his assignment to learn the inner workings of the Sov world. The end of chapter 16 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Recording by Dale Grothman. Chapter 17 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. It was a free evening for Joe, but one that Nadine had found necessary to devote to her medical duties. Max had been gushing about a cabaret in buddha a place named bexicapu where the wine flowed as wine can flow only in the balkans and where the gypsy music was as only gypsy music can be max had developed a tolerance for wine after only two or three attempts at what they called sat and which he didn't consider exactly beer joe said only half interested for proletarians party members or what max said well gee i guess it's most proletarians but in these little places like you can see almost anybody a couple of nights ago when i took off i even seen a rusky field marshal there and he was drenched joe was at loose ends besides this was a facet of budapest life he had yet to investigate the intimate night spots frequented by all strata of Sov society he came to a quick decision okay max let's give it a look possibly it'll turn out to be a place i can take nadine she's a bit weary of the overgrown glamour spots they have here they're more ostentatious than anything you find even in greater washington max said in his feisty belligerence does that mean better joe grunted amusement at the little man even as he took up his jacket no it doesn't he said and take that chip off your shoulder when you were back home you were continually beefing about what a rugged go you had being a mid-lower in the west world now that you're over here 
the merest suggestion that it's not all peaches at home and you're ready to fight max said his ugly face twisted in a grimace even as he helped joe with the jacket well all these characters over here are up to their tonsils in curd about the west they think everybody's starving over there because they're unemployed and they think the lowers are like ground down and all and that there's lots of race troubles and all even as they left the apartment joe was realizing how much closer max had already got to the actual people than either he or nadine but he was still amused he said and wasn't that largely what you used to think about things over here when you were back home how many starving have you seen max grunted well you know that's right they're not as bad off as i thought some of those telly shows i used to watch was kind of exaggerated like joe said absently if international fracases could be won by newspapers and telly reporters the soves would have lost the frigid fracas as far back as when they still called it the cold war the Bexicapu turned out to be largely what Max had reported, and Joe expected, a rather small cellar cabaret, specializing in Hungarian wines and such nibbling delicacies as turos, suksa, and cheese nokis, but specializing as well, or even more so, in romantic atmosphere dominated by heartstring touching of gypsy violins, as musicians strolled by quietly, pausing at this table and then that, to lean so close to the feminine ear that the lady was all but caressed it came to joe that there was more of this in sove world than at home the sove proletarians evidently spent less time at their telly sets than did the lowers in the west world they found a table crowded though the night spot was and ordered a bottle of chilled fetatiesca it wasn't until the waiter had recorded the order against joe's international credit card information that it was realized he and max were from the west so many non-hungarians from all over the so world were about budapest that the foreigner was an accepted large percentage of the man in the street max said making as usual no attempt to lower his voice well look there there's a sample of them not being as advanced like as the west world a waiter imagine using waiters for a beer joint how come they don't have auto bars and all sure 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 joe said dryly and canned music and a big telly screen instead of a live show maybe they prefer it this way max you can't possibly carry automation too far now nah, max protested taking a full half glass of his wine down in one gulp don't you see how this takes up people's time all these waiters and musicians and all could be home relaxing like and watching telly and sucking down tranks joe said not really interested and largely arguing for the sake of conversation a voice from the next table said coldly in accented anglo-american you don't seem to appreciate our entertainment gentlemen of the west joe looked at the source of the words there were only three officers only one in the distinctive pinched waist uniform of the hungarians a captain the other two wore the sove epaulets which proclaimed them majors but joe didn't place the nationality of the uniforms there were several bottles upon the table largely empty joe said carefully to the contrary we find it most enjoyable sir but max had had two full glasses of the potent fetiesca and besides was feeling pleased and effervescent over his success in getting joe mauser his idol to spend a night on the town with him he wanted to impress his superior with the extent to which he had got to know budapest max said now we've got places just as good as this in the west and bigger too lots bigger this joint wouldn't hold more than fifty people the one who had spoken one of the majors who wore the boots of a cavalryman said nastily indeed i recognize how that when i addressed you both as gentlemen i failed to realize that in the west gentlemen are not selective in their company and allow themselves to wallow in the gutter with the dregs of their society 
the hungarian captain said lazily are you sure for all that either of them are gentlemen there seems to be a distinctive odor about the lower classes whether in the west world or our own joe came to his feet quietly max said suddenly sobered hey major sir easy it ain't important joe had picked up his glass of wine with a gesture so easy as almost to be slow motion he tossed it in the face of the foppish officer the hungarian aghast took up his napkin and began to brush the drink from his uniform meanwhile sputtering to an extent verging on hysteria the major who had been seated immediately to his right fumbled in assistance meanwhile staring at joe as though he were a madman the cavalryman though was a sterner stuff in the back of his mind joe was thinking even as the other seized a bottle by its long neck and broke off the base on the edge of the table now this one's from the pink army an old pro and a rusky sure as zen made green apples the major came up kicking a chair to one side joe hunched his shoulders forward took up his napkin and with a quick double gesture wrapped it twice around his left hand which he extended slightly the major came in the jagged edges of the bottle advanced much as a sword his face was working in rage and joe outwardly cool decided in the back of his mind that he was glad he never had to serve under this one this one gave way to rage and temper when things were pickling and there is no room for such luxuries in a fracas max was yelling something from behind that didn't come through in the bedlam that had suddenly engulfed the bexicapu at the last moment joe suddenly struck out with his left leg hooked with his foot the small table at which the three sove officers had been sitting and twisted quickly throwing it to the side and immediately into the way of his enraged opponent the other swore as his shins banged the side and was thrown slightly forward for a moment off balance joe stepped forward quickly precisely and his right chopped down and to the side of the other's prominent jawbone the rusky if rusky he was went suddenly glazed of eye he doubled forward originally an attempt to regain balance continued and fell flat on his face joe spun around come on max let's get out of here i doubt if we're welcome he didn't want to give the other two time to organize themselves and decide to attack defeat the two he and max might be able to accomplish but joe wasn't at all sure where the waiters would stand in the fray nor anyone else in the small cabaret for that matter max at the peak of excitement now yelled what do you think i've been saying come on follow me there's a rear door next to the restroom the waiters and others were converging on them joe mauser didn't wait to argue he took max's word for it and hurried after the small worthy going round and about the interweaving tables and chairs like an old-time broken field football player the end of chapter seventeen of frigid fracas by mac reynolds recorded by dale grothman Chapter 18 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Joe Mauser had assumed there would be some sort of reverberations as a result of his run in with the Sove officers, but hadn't suspected the magnitude of them. The next morning, he had hardly arrived at the small embassy office which had been assigned him before his desk set lit up with General Armstrong's habitually worried face he said without taking time for customary amenities major mauser could you come to my office immediately it wasn't a question in general george armstrong's office besides the general himself were his aide lieutenant anderson who joe had at long last sorted out from lieutenant dixon lieutenant colonel bella koseth and another sov officer that joe hadn't met before everybody looked very stiff and formal the general said to joe major mauser colonel kosef and captain petrofi have approached me as your immediate superior to request that your diplomatic immunity be waived so that you might be called upon on a matter of honor 
Joe didn't get it. He looked from one of the two Hungarians to the other, and then back at Armstrong, scowling. Lieutenant Anderson said unhappily, These officers have been named to represent Captain Sandoz Rakoksky, Major. Bela Kosif clicked his heels, bowed, saying formally, Our principal realizes, Major Mauser, that diplomatic immunity prevents his issuing request for satisfaction. However, the Hungarian cleared his throat. Since honor is involved. At long last, it got through to Joe. His own voice went cold, even. General Armstrong, I, the general said quickly, Mauser, as an official representative of Westworld, you don't have to respond to anything as dashedly silly as a challenge to a duel. The faces of the two Hungarians froze. Joe finished his sentence. I would appreciate it if you and Lieutenant Anderson would act for me. Kosif clicked his heels again. Gentlemen, the cold duello provides that the challenged choose the weapons. General Armstrong's face, unusually worried, was now dark with anger. Choice of weapons, eh? Against Sandoz Rakoksky? If you will excuse us now, gentlemen, Lieutenant Anderson and I will consult with you in one hour in the Embassy Club and discuss the affair further. I say frankly, I have never heard of a diplomat being subjected to such a situation, especially on the part of officers of a country to which he is accredited. The Hungarians were unfazed. Kosif looked at his wrist chronometer. One hour in the Embassy Club, gentlemen. The two of them clicked again bowed at the waist, and were gone. General Armstrong glared at Joe. Dash it, if you hadn't been so confoundedly quick on the trigger, I could have warned you, Mauser. Mauser wasn't over being flabbergasted. You mean to tell me, he said, that those people still conduct duels? I thought duels had gone out back in the 19th century. Well, you're mistaken, Armstrong bit out. It seems to be a practice that can crop up in any decadent society. Remember Hitler revived it among the German universities? Well, it's all the rage now among the officers of the Soviet world. Limited, however, to party members, the lowly proletariat are assumed not to have honor. Joe shrugged. I'm not exactly an amateur at combat, you know. The general snorted his disgust and turned to his aide. Lieutenant, go find Dr. Hare for me. Then wait in the outer office, then wait in the outer office until it's time for us to meet those heel-clicking Hungarians. Yes, sir, Anderson saluted, shot another look at Joe, as though in commiseration, and left hurriedly. What's wrong with him? Joe said. Armstrong pulled open a desk drawer, brought forth a bottle and glass, poured himself a strong one, and knocked it back without offering any to his junior officer. He replaced the bottle and glass, and turned his scowl back to Joe. Haven't you ever heard of Sandoz Rakoksky? No. He happens to be all so world fencing champion, and has been for six years. He also is third from the top amongst the Red Army pistol and rifle marksmen. I once saw him put on an exhibition of trick handgun shooting. Uncanny. The man has abnormal reflexes. The door opened, and Nadine was there. Joe, she said. Dick Anderson says you've been challenged to a frame-up duel by Sandoz Rakoksky. Her eyes hurried on to Armstrong. George, this is ridiculous. Joe has diplomatic... Joe wasn't getting part of this. He broke in. What do you mean, frame up, Nadine? We got into a hassle in a night spot last night. Armstrong said, Everybody simmer down, dash it. His eyes went to Joe. Sandor Rakoksky doesn't get into hassles in night spots, not unless he's been ordered to. Captain Rakoksky is what in the old days was known as a hatchet man. He snorted in deprecation. The party no longer considers purges among its own. 
everything is all buddy buddy now purges are something from the past however those on the very top sometimes find this unfortunate one manner that has been devised to remove such party members who have become a thorn in the side of the powers that be is to have them challenged by such as sandoz rakowski joe settled down into a chair more dumbfounded than ever but that's ridiculous why why would they want me eliminated nadine said hurriedly you don't have to accept joe said if i don't i'll be laughed out of town remember the big banquet the pink army gave me when i first arrived the celebrated major joseph mauser fling what happens to westworld privilege when the celebrated joe mauser backs down from a duel anderson mused if mauser refuses to duel he's right he'll be laughed out of town if he accepts it and is killed he is still removed from the scene he looked from joe to nadine somebody evidently doesn't want joe mauser in budapest pieces were beginning to fit in joe looked at general armstrong you're one of us aren't you one of the phil holland frank hodgson group he looked at nadine why wasn't i told am i a junior member or something that i can't be trusted armstrong snorted you should study up on revolutionary routine joe the smaller the unit of organization the better the fewer members you know the fewer you can betray here in the sov world back before the soves came to power the size of their cells was five members so the most any one person could betray was four the tick started in the side of joe's mouth armstrong said hurriedly don't misunderstand your fortitude isn't being questioned bravery no longer enters into it there are methods today under which nobody could hold up he seemed to come to a sudden decision we can't let this take place you'll have to back down mauser somehow there's been a leak and your real purpose for being in budapest is known very well phil holland and the others We'll simply have to send someone else to replace you. But Joe had had enough by now. Look, he said, everybody seems to think I can't take care of myself with this foppish Molly and his fancy swordsmanship. I've had fifteen years of combat. Joe, Nadine said, don't be silly. The man's a professional assassin. This is his field, not yours joe said flatly on the other hand i have a job to do and it doesn't involve being run out of budapest general armstrong said dash it don't go drivel happy on us mauser i've just told you the man's the best swordsman in europe and asia combined and the third best shot how is he with bowie knives joe said the end of chapter 18 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. Recorded by Dale Grothman. Chapter 19 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds. To Mauser's surprise, the Soves actually turned up two genuine Bowie knives. He had expected the duel, actually, to have to be conducted with trench knives or some other alternative. But the Soves, ever great on museums had located one of the weapons of the american old west in a prague exhibit of the american frontier the other in budapest itself in an extensive collection of fighting knives down through the ages in a military museum formally correct lieutenant colonel bella kosif appeared at joe mauser's apartment three days before the duel a case in his hands max in his role as batman conducted him to joe doing little to keep his scowl of dislike for the hungarian from his face max was getting fed up with the airs of the sov officers cast lines were over here if anything more strictly drawn than at home joe came to his feet on recognizing his visitor and answered the other's bow colonel kosif he said bella kosif clicked his heels he held the case before him opened it the two fighting knives lay within 
Joe looked at them, then into the other's face. Kosath said, Frankly, Major, your somewhat unorthodox selection of weapons has been confusing. However, we have located two bowie knives. Since it is assumed that the two gentlemen opponents are not thoroughly familiar with, uh, bowie knives, it has been suggested that each be given his blade at this time. Joe got it now. Sandor Rakowski hadn't become the most celebrated duelist in the Sov world by making such mistakes as underrating his opponents. The weapon was new to him. He wanted the opportunity to practice with it. It was all right with Joe. Kosith clicked his heels again. Our selection, unfortunately, is limited to two weapons. Since you are the challenged, Captain Rakowski insists you take first choice. Joe shrugged and took up the first one, then the other. It had been some time since he had held one of the famous frontier weapons in his hands. When still a sergeant in the category military, he had once become close companions with an old pro whose specialty was teaching hand-to-hand -hand combat. Over a period of years, he and Joe had become comrades, going from one fracas to another as a team. He had taught Joe considerable, including the belief that of all the blade hand weapons ever devised, the knife invented by Jim Bowie, whose frontier career ended at the Alamo, was the most efficient. Joe ran his eyes over the blades carefully. On the back of one was stamped James Black, Washington, Arkansas. Joe had found what he was looking for. However, he pretended to examine the other knife as well ignoring the Sheffield, England stamp of manufacture. The Bowie knife, blade eleven inches long by an inch and a half wide, the heel three-eighths of an inch thick at the back, the point at the exact center of the width of the blade, which curved to a point convexly from the edge, and from the back concavely, both curves being as sharp as the edge itself. The cross guard was heavy brass, rather than steel, and a further backing of brass along the heel, up to the extent where the curve toward the point began. Brass, which is softer than steel, and could catch an opponent's blade, rather than allowing it to slip off and away. Joe balanced the weapon he had selected, and shrugged. This one will do, he said. Kosef clicked the case with the remaining knife shut. He could see no difference between the two. The selection of weapons had been a formality. Max saw him to the door and returned to the living room. He said worriedly, Major, sir, you're sure you're checked out on that thing? I've been asking around like, and they put those duels on telly here, just like we got fracases back home. This here Captain Rakowski's got one whopper of a reputation. He's quick as a snake, kind of like a freak. He can move faster than most people. So they tell me, Joe mused, balancing the frontier weapon in his hand. It had a beautiful balance, this knife so big that it could be used as a hatchet or a machete. He was still contemplating the vicious-looking blade when Nadine entered. He smiled up at her, put the knife aside on the table, and came to his feet. She looked at Max, and the little man turned and left the room. Nadine said, Joe, a plane is leaving this afternoon. A Westworld plane for London. Joe looked at her speculatively. I won't be on it. Joe, listen. A year ago you were an individual, trying to fight your way up to upper caste. You weren't able to make it as an individual, Joe. But now you're a member of an organization, pledged to a high ideal. Joe, the organization doesn't need martyrs at this stage. It does need good, competent, highly trained members, such as Joe Mauser. He said nothing. Nadine stepped suddenly closer to him. Her perfume, he noted vaguely, was new, some sweet scent found here in the soap world, undoubtedly. It had a heady quality, or was that merely the close presence of Nadine herself? She put her arms around his neck and pulled his head down to her level. He had never realized that Nadine Hare was this much shorter than he. She pressed the softness of her lips to his. 
then she held back a foot or two and said into his face desperately seriously does this make any difference to you joe he licked the edges of his lips carefully it makes a great deal of difference his voice was thick his arms came up behind him then you'll be on the plane he shook his head she wrenched herself suddenly free and stood back from him infuriated he had never seen anyone so infuriated he said look darling if i backed out of this the way you want you think you'd be happy but you wouldn't you want a man not a coward i want a live man not a dead hero he shook his head stubbornly you mentioned the organization all right they sent us to do a job here they can't move in the west world until they know where the so world stands they can't afford an attack a sudden heating up of the frigid fracas right in the middle of the confusion of a socio-economic change they've got to know how the so world stands what it will do they've got to know about this so-called underground and the religious revival stuff out there in siberia you've been discovered she said hotly they can send somebody else he was still stubborn no there's a leak if they send somebody else the same thing will happen and the next man might not be as much a potential opponent for such as sandoz rakoksky as even i am if i run now the west loses prestige and the movement sponsored by holland and hodgson and the rest of us loses prestige too somewhere in budapest is some kind of a group that is watching us we don't know who or where or what they stand for but we can't afford to lose prestige with them we're not exactly going to gain it when and if this official assassin kills you she looked down at the wicked knife and shuddered oh joe your mercenary career is over miraculously you stayed alive for fifteen years through it all from the rank of private all the way up to the rank of major now at long last you're an upper you're not going to throw it all away now he could say nothing she stamped a foot in uncharacteristic fury you silly clod suppose you do win don't you see they'll simply send another killer after you they're out to get you joe mauser don't you see you can't win against the whole so world next time possibly they won't be quite so formal possibly a few footpads in the streets do you think they haven't the resources to kill a single man the side of his mouth twitched i'm sure they have but it will give me a few days before they come up with something else it'd be too conspicuous if i fought their top duelist one day and then was cut down on the streets the next she spun in a fury and all but ran from the room and from his apartment joe looked after her ruefully he growled in sour humor every time matters pickle for me my gal goes into a tizzy and runs off the end of chapter 19 of frigid fracas by mac reynolds read by dale grothman chapter 20 of frigid fracas by mac reynolds as Max had said, as one of their alternatives to the fracases of the Westworld, the Soves put on telly such duels as were fought amongst their supposedly honor-conscious officer caste. Evidently, the lower caste of the proletarian paradise was well on the way to its own version of bread and circuses. In fact, Joe had already wondered what their version of Trank was. But though the telly cameramen were highly evident, and for this inordinary affair had six cameras in all placed strategically so that every phase of the fight could be recorded they were not allowed to be so close as by any chance to interfere with the duel itself spaced well back from the action they must needs depend upon zoom lenses joe mauser and sandoz rakoksky stood stripped to the waist both in tight non-restricting trousers both wearing tennis shoes general armstrong and lieutenant anderson on one side and lieutenant colonel kosuth 
and Captain Pettifee on the other stood at the sides of their principals. Kosuth was saying formally, It has been agreed, then, that the gentlemen participants shall be restricted to this ring measuring twenty feet across. Seconds will remain withdrawn to twenty feet beyond that. The conflict shall begin upon General Armstrong calling commence, and shall end upon one or the other, or both of the gentlemen participants, falling to the ground. Minor wounds shall not halt the conflict. This is understood? Yes, Joe said. He had been sizing up his enemy. The man stripped well. He was almost a duplicate of Joe's build, perhaps slightly lighter, slightly taller. Like Joe, he bore a dozen scars on his upper torso. Sandoz Rokoski hadn't worked his way up to the top of the dueling world without taking his share of punishment. Rokoski said something curtly, obviously affirmative, in Hungarian. Lieutenant Anderson, his open face drawn worriedly, tendered Joe his bowie knife. Captain Petoffi offered Rakotsky his. The two men stepped into the arena, which had been floored with sand, its dimensions marked with blue chalk. Though nothing had been said, it was obvious that if a combatant stepped over this line, he would have lost face. They stood at opposite sides of the arena, both with arms loosely at their sides, both holding their fighting knives in their right hands. General Armstrong said, his voice tight with worry, Ready, Captain Rakowski? The Hungarian used his affirmative word again. Ready, Major Mauser? Ready, Joe said. He felt like adding, Ready as I'm ever going to be. He was feeling qualms now. He'd been too long in the game not to recognize a superlative opponent when he saw one. The four seconds drew back their twenty feet and joined the two doctors and half a dozen hospital assistants who were there. Further back still, Joe knew, were the emergency facilities. Two men, by contemporary usage, were going to be allowed to butcher each other. But moments after, all the facilities of modern medical science were going to be at their disposal. Joe felt a wry twinge of humor at the incongruity of it. General Armstrong called, Commence! Joe spread his legs, grasped the knife so that his thumb was along the side of the blade, and held approximately waist-high. He shuffled forward, slowly, feeling the consistency of the sand. There must be no slipping. The Sove officer had assumed the stance of a swordsman. His smile was fox-like. For the first time, Joe noticed the scar along the other's cheek. It was white now, which brought it into prominence. Yes, Sandoz Rakowski, in his time, had copped one more than once. At least the man wasn't infallible. As they came cautiously toward each other, the Hungarian grinned, fox fashion, and said in his heavily accented Anglo-American, Ah, our bad man from the West! You thought to choose a weapon unknown to Rakowski, eh? But perhaps you've never heard of the Italian short sword, eh? Did you think this clumsy weapon is so different from the Italian short sword, eh? Joe had never heard of the Italian short sword, though it came back to him that some of the phony fracas films he had seen back home had depicted medieval duelists fighting with two swords, one long, one short. Obviously, his Sov opponent was thoroughly familiar with the usage. Joe swore inwardly. They circled warily, watching for an opening, sizing up the other. Each knew that once action was joined, the events would most likely progress quickly. The bowie knife is not built for finesse. In a flash, Sandoz Rakowski darted in, his blade flicked, he leapt back instantly on guard again. There was a streak of red down Joe's arm. He blinked. Somebody, General Armstrong, or was it Max, had said there was something freakish about this Hungarian. His reflexes were unbelievably fast. Now Joe could believe it. He attempted a slashing blow himself, and the other danced away so quickly that Joe had not come within feet of his opponent. Rakowski laughed insinuatingly. Oaf, he said. Is that the word? Clumsy, awkward, stumbling? Oaf. It is well to rid the world of such, eh? He was a talker, 
Joe had met the type before, especially in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They talked, usually insultingly, sometimes bringing up such matters as your legitimacy or the virtue of your wife or sister, or your own supposed perversions. They talked, and by so doing hoped to enrage you, provoke you into foolish attack. Joe was untouched by such tactics. He circled again, his mind moving quickly. He had, he realized, no advantages on his side. He was neither stronger nor faster than the other, and he had no reason to believe that he had greater stamina. If anything, it might be the other way. Rakowski was in again, through Joe's guard, guarding his blade as though it were a foil. A cut opened magically on Joe's chest from the left nipple to the navel, and bled profusely. The Soviet duelist was back a good six feet, and laughing openly. Joe had had insufficient time even to move one foot in retreat at the other's offensive. Joe Mauser wet his lips. The tick at the side of his mouth was in full evidence. Rakowski jeered. Ah, my bad man from the West who throws wine in the face of gentlemen. You grow afraid, eh? Your mouth twitches? You feel in your stomach the fear of death, eh? No longer do you worry about locating the Sov world underground and helping to overthrow the party, eh? Now you worry about death. Joe tried to rush him, plowing through the sand. But the Hungarian danced back, still jeering. He obviously knew the feel of sand beneath foot, as Joe did not. Joe had no time to wonder over Armstrong and Anderson agreeing to a sand-deep arena. They had messed up on that one. For Joe, it was like trying to operate on a sandy beach. But Rakowski seemed in his element. Even as Joe's attack slowed in frustration, the other darted in, slashed once, twice, scoring on Joe's left arm, once, twice. He was beginning to resemble a bloody mess. None of the wounds were overly deep, but combined they were costing him blood. He got the feeling that the Hungarian could finish him off at will, that Rakowski had his number, that it was no longer a matter of the other being careful not to underestimate the foe. Joe had been correctly estimated and found wanting. He realized that by sinking to the sand, he could throw the fight. The duel ended upon one combatant or the other falling to the sand. And then he could see the other's expression. There was no throwing in of the towel for Joe Mauser. At the first sign of such a move, the other would dart in, cobra-like, and deal the finishing blow, the death blow. Rakowski was fully capable of such speed. The man was a phenomenon, metabolically speaking. Joe, his heels almost to the chalk light of the arena boundary, dashed suddenly forward again. His opponent jeered as before, darted backward with such speed even through the sand as to be unbelievable. Joe Mauser grinned wolfishly. He tossed the bowie knife suddenly into the air. It turned in a spin to come down blade in his hand. He stepped forward with his left foot, through with full might. The bowie knife, balanced to turn once completely in thirty feet, blurred through the air and buried itself in the Hungarian's abdomen up to the hilt. The Sov officer grunted in agony, staring down at the protruding hilt unbelievingly. His eyes came up in hate, glaring at Joe who stood there across from him, hands now extended forward in the stance of a karate fighter. Joe could follow the other's agonized thoughts in his expression. There were medics available, and though the wound was a decisive one, it need not be fatal, not in this day of surgery and antibiotics. No, not fatal, the Sov officer decided. He glared at Joe again, his teeth grinding in his pain and shock. To move across the ring at the American would be disastrous, stirring the heavy bowie knife in his intestines. Rakowski knew he had only split seconds. Then he must sink to the sand so that aid might come. But perhaps split seconds would be sufficient. He reversed his own knife in hand, preparatory to throwing. Joe watched him. The other's face was a mask of pure agony, but he was no quitter. He was going to make his own throw. It came blurringly fast, too fast to avoid. The heavy frontier knife turned over half in the air and struck Joe along the side, 
glancing off, ineffectively. Sandoz Rakowski fell to the sand, and the medics came on the run, both toward him and to Joe. And then the fog began to roll in on Joe Mauser. He noted, as though distantly, that the medical assistance that General Armstrong had provided from the Westworld Embassy was headed by Dr. Nadine Hare, who seemed to be crying, which was uncalled for in a doctor with a patient, after all. End of Chapter 20 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds Recording by Dale Grothman Chapter 21 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds His wounds were clean, straight slashes, not overly deep, and which should heal readily enough. In his time, Joe Mauser had copped many more serious ones. However, after bandaging, Nadine relegated him to the small embassy hospital. Westworld diplomats would not even trust the so-world medical care preferring to import their own category medicine personnel. He was, so Max informed him, the lion of the Westworld colony in Budapest, and the Newt World too, for that matter. It was quite a scandal that a diplomatic representative had been challenged to a duel by a known killer of Rakowski's reputation. Informal protests were lodged. Joe, cynically, could imagine just how effective they would be particularly at this late date. A lion he might be, but Nadine was not allowing him visitors this first day of his recuperation. Max to attend him, but no others. At least so it was throughout the morning and early afternoon. Then, so obvious was it that his hurts were not of paramount importance, she relented to the extent of allowing General Armstrong to enter. The General scowled down at him, as though to read just how badly Joe was feeling. He grumbled finally. Dash it, you look nothing so much as an overgrown hamburger steak there for a while, Mauser. Joe grinned wryly. That's how I felt, he said. I've never seen anyone move so fast. Armstrong said curiously, If you wanted to use throwing knives, why didn't you challenge him to a duel with throwing knives? Joe shifted his shoulders. I figured my only chance with him was to use a weapon with which he wasn't familiar. The bowie knife was it. It didn't occur to him that a knife built in that shape, and as big as that, was a precisely constructed throwing knife, as well as one to use hand to hand. Joe twisted his mouth. Besides, if the Soves think all the Machiavellians are on their side, they're wrong. Poor Captain Rakotsky got sucked in. I had a throwing knife and he didn't. Armstrong looked at him blankly. Joe explained. The knife designed by Jim Bowie was made by a smith named James Black of Washington, Arkansas. Bowie made himself so notorious with it that the blade became world famous, and Black made quite a few exact copies. Various other outfits tried to duplicate his work, but actually none succeeded in producing the perfect balance in such a large knife that made it practical for throwing. It turns over once in thirty feet, exactly. All I had to do was get Rakowski fifteen feet away from me, and he'd had it. And his own knife, when he tried to reciprocate, was off balance. Armstrong said, Zen. By the way, how is he? Joe said. Armstrong said soberly, He's dead, Mauser. Dead? With all those doctors standing around? The general's face assumed its habitual worried expression. I rather doubt that he died of your knife. The highest echelons of the party do not approve of failures. You were correct when you said you would have lost prestige had you fled Rakowski's challenge, or even insisted on your diplomatic immunity rights. As it is, the prestige has been lost on the other side. By the way, it occurs to me that no further effort will be made to eliminate you physically. It would be too blatant. Joe said, One of the things I wanted to talk to you about, General, while we were in there together, Rakowski was sounding off in an effort to crack my nerve, called me a lot of names and that sort of thing. But he also said, I'll try to repeat this exactly. 
No longer do you worry about locating the Sov World Underground and helping overthrow the party, eh? Armstrong slumped down into the bedside chair. Dash it, that makes it definite. They're fully aware of your mission, though they haven't got it exactly right. Your purpose wasn't to aid the local underground, but merely to size it up, to get the overall picture. He snorted his disgust. I'll have to get in touch with our organization in Greater Washington. One thing's certain, we are not going to be able to let you go into the field in your status as military attaché and observer. Joe had been scheduled to observe some of the combat taking place in Chinese Turkestan with nomad rebels. He had looked forward to the experience in view of his own background, wondering in what manners the Sov forces of the Pink Army differed from the mercenary armies of the West World. He said now, Why not? Armstrong snorted. You'd never come out alive. There'd be an accident and the nomads would be given the dubious credit for having killed you. He came to his feet again. I've got to think about this. I'll drop by later, Mauser. Joe thought about it, too, after the other had left. Obviously, the restrictions on his movements were a growing handicap on his abilities to serve the organization headed by Holland Hodgson. He wondered if he was becoming useless. Max stuck his head in the door and said, Major, sir, one of these Hungarians wants to see you. Who? Joe growled. And why? It's, uh, it's that Lieutenant Colonel Kosuth one, sir. I told him Dr. Hare said you couldn't be bothered, but he don't want to seem to take no for an answer. Kosuth, Joe knew, was assigned to the Westworld Embassy Military Attaché Department on a full-time basis. It occurred to him that the Hungarian would be privy to the inner workings of the party as they applied to Joseph Mauser and his associates. Show him in, he told Max. But the doc... Show him in, Max. Lieutenant Colonel Bella Kosuth was solicitous. He clicked his heels, bowed from the waist, inquired of Joe's well-being. Joe wasn't feeling up to military amenities after his frame-up near demise of the day before. He growled, I'd think you'd be wishing I occupied Captain Rakowski's place rather than offering me sympathy. The Hungarian's eyebrow went up, and uninvited he took the chair next to the bed. But why? You were the man's second. Kosuth said expansively, When asked to act, I could hardly refuse a brother officer. Besides, my superiors suggested that I take the part. As you probably have ascertained, Major, there is considerable doubt the desirability of you remaining in Budapest. Joe was astonished. You mean to sit there and deliberately admit the duel was a planned attempt to eliminate me? The colonel looked about the room. Why not, Major? There is no one here to witness our conversation. And you admit that your precious party, the ruling organ of this proletariat paradise of yours, actually orders what amounts to assassination? Kosuth examined his fingernails with studied nonchalance. Why not admit it? The party will do literally anything to maintain itself in its position, Major. Certainly, the death of a junior officer of the Westworld means nothing to them. But aren't you a party member yourself? Of course, one must be if one is to operate as freely as circumstance allows in this best of all possible worlds this paradise of ours. Joe sank back on his pillow. He couldn't get used to the idea of this man, whom he had always thought as an arch-stereotype Sov world officer, speaking in this manner. Kosuth crossed his legs comfortably. See here, Major, you are all but naive in your understanding of our society. Let me, uh, brief you on the history of this part of the world and the organization which governs it. Have you studied Marx and Engels? No, Joe said. I've read a few short extracts and a few criticisms, or criticisms of criticisms of short extracts, that sort of thing. Kosuth nodded seriously. That's all practically anybody does anymore, even in the so world where we give lip service to them. 
The point I was about to make is that the supposed founders of our society had nothing even remotely approaching this in mind when they did their research. It evidently never occurred to either that the first attempts to achieve the... The Hungarian's voice went dry. Glorious revolution would take place in such ultra-backward countries as Russia and China. The revolution of which they wrote presupposed a highly industrialized, technical economy. Neither Russia nor, later, China had this. The, um, excesses that occurred in both countries in the mid-twentieth century were the result of efforts to rectify this. The party, in power as a result of the confusion following in one case the First World War, and in the second case the Second World War, tried to lift the nations into the industrial world by the bootstraps. The colonel cleared his throat. Let us say that some elements resisted the sacrifices the party demanded. The peasants, for instance. Joe said, dryly himself, If I am correctly informed on the soul world history, you do not exaggerate. Exactly. Let us admit it. Stalin, in particular, but others too, both before and following him, were ruthless in their determination to achieve industrialization and raise the Sov world to the level of the most advanced countries. Joe said, This isn't exactly news to me, Colonel. Of course not. Bear with me. I was but making background. To accomplish these things, the party had to, and did, became a strong, ruthless, even merciless organization, with all power safely, from its viewpoint, of course, in its hands and in spite of all the handicaps and setbacks, eventually succeeded in the task it had set itself, that is, the achieving of an industrialized nation. The Hungarian pursed his lips. But then comes the rub. Have you ever heard, Major Mauser, of a ruling class, caste, clique, call it what you will, which stepped down from power freely and willingly, handing over the reins of government to some other element? Joe vaguely remembered hearing similar words from some other source in the not-too-distant past. But by now he was fully taken up by the astonishing Sov officer. He shook his head, encouraging the other to continue. Kosuth nodded. They tell me that in ancient Greece and Rome, tyrants, or dictators, would assume full powers for a period long enough to meet some emergency, and would then relinquish such power. I do not know. I would think it doubtful. But whether or not such was done in ancient Greece, it has been a rare practice indeed since. A ruling caste, like a socio-economic system itself, when taken as a whole, instinctively perpetuates its life, as though a living organism. It cannot understand, will not admit, that it is ever time to die. The Hungarian waggled a finger at Joe. At first, when there was insufficient even of the basics such as food, clothing, and shelter, the party members soon learned to take care of their own, explaining this deviation from the original party austerity by various means. Nepotism raised its head, as always, almost from the very beginning. Party members wished their children to become party members, and saw to it that they secured the best education and the best jobs. And, how do you Americans put it, the practice of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours became the rule. Soon we had a self-perpetuating hierarchy, jealous of its position, and jealous of the attempts of outsiders to break into the sanctified organization. Marx and Engels wrote that following the revolution, the state would wither away. The colonel laughed acidly. Instead, in the Sov world, it continually strengthened itself. A new class, as the Yugoslav Milovan Gilas called it, had been born. The Hungarian seemed to switch subjects slightly. And a new development manifested itself. At first, Russia alone was the Sov world but as she became increasingly powerful, she exported her revolution, taking over in such advanced countries as 
let's say, Czechoslovakia and East Germany. Here, supposedly, would have been the conditions under which the original ideas of Marx and his collaborator would have flourished. But the party moved in its heavy bureaucracy and prevented any such development. Bela Kosef laughed gently. Aha! But this led to one of the ironies of fate, my friend, because as the so world expanded its borders, it assimilated peoples of far more, um, sharpness, shall we say, than our somewhat dour Ruskies. In time, bit by bit, inch by inch, intrigue by intrigue. I know, Joe said, the capital of the so world is now not Moscow, but Budapest. Correct, the Hungarian beamed. At the very first, we Hungarians tried to fight them. When we found we couldn't prevail, we joined them, to their eventual sorrow. However, the central problem has not been erased. We have finally achieved, here in the Sov world, to the point where we have the abundant life. The affluent society. But we have also reached stagnation. The party, like a living organism, refuses to die, cannot even admit that its death is desirable. He held his hands out, palm upward, as though at an impossible impasse. Joe said suddenly, What's all this got to do with me, Colonel Kosuth? The Hungarian pretended surprise. Why, nothing at all, Major Mauser. I was but making conversation, small talk. Joe didn't get it. Well, why come here at all? Max said you were rather insistent about seeing me, in spite of doctor's orders. Ah, yes, of course, the Sov officer came to his feet again and clicked his heels. My superiors have requested that I deliver this into your own hands, as well as copies to the Westworld ambassador, to General Armstrong, and to Dr. Hare. He handed a document to Joe. Joe turned it over in hand, blankly. It was in Hungarian. He looked at the other. Lieutenant Colonel Bela Kosas said formally, The government of the Sov world has found Major Joseph Mauser, Dr. Nadine Hare, and General George Armstrong, persona non grata. As soon as your health permits, Major, it is requested that you leave Budapest and all the lands of the Sov world never to return. He clicked his heels, bowed again, and started for the door. Just as he reached it, he turned and said one last thing to Joe Mauser. The End of Chapter 21 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds Recorded by Dale Grothman Chapter 22 of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds in spite of Nadine Har's protest, Joseph Mauser insisted that they abide by the Sov government's expulsion order on the following day. A special plane took them to London, and they caught the regular shuttle to Greater Washington. At least Joe, Nadine, and Max did. General Armstrong remained on in London. The flight itself was largely uneventful, Joe having retreated into his thoughts. He had a great deal to think about not only in regard to the immediate collapse of his mission, but both of the past and future as well. Max, looking out the plane's window as they took off, bore an air of nostalgia. Look there, he pointed. You can see the big statue of the Magar warriors. They're in front of the Sep Movesetti Museum, like. He sighed. I had a date with a Croat girl, to meet her there tomorrow night. I was making good time with Carla. She thought it was romantic, me being from the West and all. Max, my friend, Joe growled, save us the lurid details of your romances. But his voice hadn't really borne irritation. Max went on. You know, you kind of get used to these people. They aren't much different like than us. Take fracases, for instance. They don't have them like we do. But they've got their telly teams out there in Siberia, and the lads had to go chasing the rebels and all. And they got their duels they cover on telly. But I was thinking, why don't they get modern 
and have real fracases like us. And then we could have, like, international meets, and they'd send a division, and we'd send one, and have it out. San, that'd be something to watch. Joe winced. Nadine said, Max, it took the human race ten thousand years to put even a temporary halt to the international war, and now you want to bring it back for the sake of a sadistic telly show? Ah, uh, but gee, Joe Mauser said, Max, go on back to the bar and have yourself a drink. I want to talk to Nadine. When the little man was gone, Joe said, in a conversational tone, We can get married tomorrow, right after we've reported to Phil Holland and the others. Her eyes widened. Well, really, don't you think you might ask me about it? He shook his head. No, we've covered all the preliminaries. The trouble with me has been that I've continued to look up at you. I suppose the caste system is too deeply ingrained in me. But now, you're my woman, period. I suppose you've actually been wondering why I've been such a slow clod. Do you think you're looking down at me now? She countered indignantly. No, just evenly. We'll get married as soon as possible. Her voice became strangely demure. Yes, Joe, she said. They drove immediately from the airport to the office of Phil Holland, stopping only long enough for Joe to make a phone call. They retraced the route over which Nadine had taken him that day that seemed so long ago, but actually wasn't. Through the long corridors, and eventually to the small office with the receptionist. Miss McHale said brightly, Dr. Hare, Major Mauser, Mr. Holland is expecting you. Go right in. Just before pressing through the door, Nadine put her hand on Joe's arm and looked into his face ruefully. Darling, you've had so much hard luck in your time. I'm sorry this first assignment for the organization had to be a failure. Joe wet his lips carefully. Why do you think it was, he said, opening the door. Nadine could only stare as he ushered her into Phil Holland's presence. That crisp, efficient operator made much the same motions he had the first time Joe had met him here, holding a chair for Nadine, shaking hands briskly with Joe, and motioning to another chair for him. While they were getting settled, Frank Hodgson sauntered in, seemingly as lackadaisically and disinterested as ever. After a minimum of exchange pleasantries, he subsided into the couch and fished for a pipe and tobacco. Holland took in Joe's arm, still immobilized in the sling, and the other signs of his wounds. He said crisply, I thought that we had removed you permanently from the field of combat, Joe. Joe said sourly, Some of the Soves thought otherwise. Holland said, an element of irritation in his voice, it's hard to understand how you could have revealed yourself so quickly. Joe pursed his lips and looked at Nadine. He said, I think I figured that out. It's practically impossible for Nadine to dissimulate, and I've never seen her and her brother together, but what they weren't arguing. Nadine was frowning at him. What has Balt to do with it? Joe said, I have a sneaking suspicion that in the heat of one of your arguments with your brother, the Baron, you revealed your and my mission and its real purpose. Nadine's right hand went to her mouth. Joe finished with, And the Baron, after all, is a member of the Nathan Hale Society. I have no doubts that the organization has some connections with their equal number in the Sov world. Holland grunted. Very possible. However, it's done now. The thing is, what is your opinion, Joe, and yours, Nadine, on the advisability of sending other operatives on the same mission? Joe shook his head. Unnecessary. Frank Hodgson paused in lighting his pipe to peer through the smoke. Joe said, In fact, it was unnecessary to send Nadine and me. Holland's voice was testy. I assure you, Joe, the particular assignment was quite important. We cannot afford to move here in the West until we know what the Soul World will do. 
Your task was a delicate one, obviously. You simply couldn't go to their government and ask. There are strong elements in not only the upper caste, but even in the middle and lower ones here in this country, who would spring to the defense of the present Westworld society if they thought an attempt was being made to alter its structure. If the Sov government reported that it had been approached by elements of a revolutionary group, the fat would be in the fire. Joe nodded. I realize all that. You were expected to worm your way into their circles, to feel them out, to contact their own underground, if one exists, to ferret out definite information on how they would react if we began definite changes in the status quo here. Joe continued to nod. Holland was increasingly irritated. Then why, good heavens, do you say your mission was unnecessary? Because they had already sent a mission over here to contact us, Joe told him evenly. Had he suddenly got up from his chair, walked up the wall, across the ceiling, then down the other wall, they could not have stared at him the more. The telemic on Phil Holland's desk squeaked something, and he took time enough to snap. No, I told you, Miss Mikhail, I'm not to be disturbed by anyone. But Joe said, if that's Colonel Lajos Arpad, I suggest you have him in. I took the liberty of phoning him and asking him to meet us here. Phil Hodson was the first to recover. Arpad, that spy? I'm just about to gather enough dope on him to have him declared persona non grata and ship him back to Budapest. As I was shipped back to Greater Washington, Joe said dryly. Colonel Arpad and I seemed to duplicate each other's activities in almost everything. Phil Holland said crisply into the communicator, Ask the colonel to come in, Miss Mikhail. Ever the correct Sov world officer, Colonel Arpad came to attention immediately upon entering the room, clicked heels, bowed from the waist. Except for Joe Mauser, none of them had met him, but he evidently knew all, greeting them by name. The men came to their feet. Joe said, Meet Colonel Lajos Arpad, high in the ranks of the Sov World Party, and at present on a secret mission from the Sov World Underground Revolutionary Organization. Joe ended wryly, his mission being to determine what action the West World might make if the secret group which has determined to make basic changes in the Sov World socio-economic system was to take action. It was the Hungarian who stared now, his eyes bored into Joe's face. I do not, of course, admit that, Major Mauser. But where in the world did you receive that strange opinion? Joe sat down again. The blood he had lost still bothered him, and he tired easily. He said, From Colonel Kosef in Budapest, another high-ranking member of your group. Joe's eyes went back to Holland and Hodgson. Quick-minded these two might be, but they were being asked to assimilate some shocking information. Joe brought it all out. I don't know why it didn't occur to any of us that the problems of the West World and those of the So World at long last have become similar, almost identical. Both, following different paths, have achieved the affluent society, so-called, but in doing it, both managed to inflict upon themselves a caste system that perpetuated itself, eventually to the detriment of progress. In the past, revolutions used to be accomplished by the masses, pushed beyond the point of endurance. A starving lower class, trying to change the rules of society so as to realize a better life. But now, in neither West nor in the Sov world, are there any starving. The majority of lowers and proletarians are well clothed, fed, and housed, and bemused by fracases and trank pills, or their equivalent over there. Joe shrugged, the weariness growing. Possibly Nadine had been right, he shouldn't have traveled so soon. The best elements in both countries have finally realized that changes must be made. These elements, the more capable, the more competent, the more intelligent, already are running each country, though they are not necessarily uppers or party members. Phil Holland here, supposedly a middle secretary to the foreign minister, actually has performed that worthy's work 
for several administrations. Frank Hodgson is the working head of the Bureau of Investigation, though only a middle. I assume a similar situation prevails in Budapest. Arpad still stood. It does. Joe came to his feet, looking at Nadine. He said, Gentlemen, I evidently have not recovered from my recent duel as much as I thought. I had better retire. Meanwhile, I suggest you exchange some notes. Nadine hurried to his side, worried. Holland, Hodgson, and Arpeg were staring at each other, somewhat like small boys or strange dogs. Hodgson grumbled, his voice for once forgetting to express laziness. Our records show you to be a Sov espionage agent. The Hungarian nodded, equally suspicious. That is my official position, but I am also, secretly, a member of the executive committee of the organization of which Major Mauser speaks, and have been attempting for some time to get in touch with the Westworld Underground, if one existed. I had about come to the conclusion that no such group was in existence until today. Joe said, Relax, boys. Let down your hair. You've got a lot in common. It looks as though, at long last, the frigid fracas is beginning to fade away. The End of Frigid Fracas by Mac Reynolds This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dale Grothman